Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Fighting Game Retrospectives, and this year has been great for this show. We've covered some iconic franchises and cult classics, but for our final episode of the year, I want to go out with something different. I want to go out with a dash of anime. No, no, no. More anime. No. More anime. More anime. Eh, slightly less anime. Let's pull it back a bit. There it is! Yes, folks, this is one of those games I've been looking forward to covering ever since we started the fighting game retrospectives. It's a series low with creative mechanics, stylish sprite work, and memorable characters. A game that largely defined the seventh generation of consoles, helped Arc Systems return to the world of fighting games, and has an appeal that goes beyond the FGC itself. So today, the Wheel of Fate is turning as we dive into a world of beast, robots, magic, whatever the hell this guy is. And we talk about this series development, the groundbreaking gameplay, and the lore that... The lore... That... Oh. Oh god, right. I have to... Actually explain... The story of Blaze Blue now, don't I? Uh... Is it too late to go back to Waku Waku 7? Yes, welcome to another episode of the Fighting Game Retrospectives, and folks, I am not kidding when I say this is a big one. And for once, that's not because of some crazy development problems, although believe me, there are going to be a couple of those too. No, on this show, we tackle the behind-the-scenes stories of your favorite fighters, but we also tackle the in-game stories. We talk about the characters and the plots of these series, and I have to get this out of the way right now. If you know anything about Blaze Blue, it's that this game has the craziest, most complicated story in any video game. Not in any fighting game. Games, period. More than Tekken, more than Metal Gear, more than Kingdom Hearts, even more than Guilty Gear. I can sum up the plot of Guilty Gear in a tweet. Mankind knew that they cannot change society. So instead of reflecting on themselves, they blamed the beasts. Done. Read that while listening to some Queen music, and you're good. The plot of Blaze Blue? That was 5% of one game. So I'm sure that some of you tuned in today thinking, Oh man, I can't wait to finally learn the plot of Blaze Blue. And do you... I have to apologize, because after studying everything that I could, after going through all the story modes and reading all the wikis, I have come to the conclusion that the story of Blaze Blue would be too long and too complicated, 
and require far too much explaining to fit in here with the development and the mechanics and everything else that we have to cover. So no, I'm sorry, but we will not be covering the story. In this video, that's what part two is going to be for. Yes, folks, this is going to be a two-parter. Part one will cover the development and gameplay and features of each individual game, as well as giving you a very basic introduction to the characters and story. Then part two will be the actual breakdown of the plot. I decided to do this because, as I said, this story is so big and complicated, it would make this video a jumbled mess trying to fit everything together. But also because, honestly, I know there are a lot of people out there who just want to know what the hell this story is, and they just want a video only about that. They don't want to sit through me talking about the gameplay, so for those people, I think they'd be much happier just getting their own video. So, if that's you, then make sure that you click that subscribe button, so that way you'll know when part 2 comes out. Also, just going to throw it out there right now, but we set a goal at the beginning of the year to hit 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and we are so close right now. So if you do decide to subscribe, then thank you, I really do appreciate that. But for now, let's talk about Blaze Blue's creation. The story of how the Blaze Blue universe was born began several years before the first title was even pitched, and it was birthed from the dying ashes of another fighter, Guilty Gear. Yes, if you know your anime Air Dashers, then you've probably heard these two compared quite often, and for good reason. Their histories are deeply tied to each other. Guilty Gear was the predominant fighting game franchise for Japanese developer Arc System Works, and while it never sold as much as Street Fighter, or Tekken, or Mortal Kombat, or Darkstalkers, or Star Gladiator, yeah, look at the sales figures on Guilty Gear sometime, its early games did not do well. But despite those sales, it did have some of the most stylish sprites, quickest combat, and inventive mechanics of any game out there, and it built up a fan base that was fiercely dedicated to it. And I'm including myself in there. I've loved Guilty Gear ever since X2. The moment I saw every insane thing this game was capable of, it instantly became one of my favorites. But what does all this have to do with Blaze Blue? Well, Guilty Gear was a very personal project for its creator, Daisuke Ishiwatari. He had built up this massive world and long-running story connecting all these games, and you could feel how much he loved these characters. Hell, he even voiced the protagonist of the series. This was his baby. So you can only imagine how much it must have hurt him when he saw his creation taken away from him. You see, Guilty Gear, with its sleek graphics and crazy story modes and all the work that went into them, cost a lot of money. Money that Arc Systems didn't always have. So, most of their games were published by Sammy, meaning they owned the rights to them. And Sammy, for years, had been trying to merge with Sega, but Sega kept telling them no. But Sammy was determined, so they kept waiting, watching for the moment that Sega slipped up. And speaking of Sega slip-ups, the Dreamcast! And the Saturn! And the Sega CD! Okay, there were a lot of slip-ups back-to-back, it wasn't exactly one thing that did Sega in. But after the fall of the Dreamcast, Sega hit rock bottom, and Sammy was there to take advantage of it. They merged with Sega to create the new Sega Sammy Holdings Company, and gave them all their properties, including Guilty Gear. To which Sega said... Uh... Thanks... Yeah, Sega really had no interest in making someone else's fighting game. Hell, they barely had any interest in making their own fighting game at the time. And I should clarify, yes, Arc Systems could still technically make a Guilty Gear game, but it wouldn't be the same. Because Arc Systems owned the rights to the characters from the first game, but any character after that now belonged to Sega. So, if they wanted to make a new game, they could include characters like Dizzy, or Eno, or so many other characters who were very important to the story, and Daisuke really cared about that story. So, even though he tried to make a new game that could work around these restrictions, it just wasn't the same. Also, it wasn't a fighting game, and it kind of sucked, so yeah, it had that going against it. So eventually, Arc Systems had to accept that Guilty Gear was gone. Their standout franchise was now the victim of corporate IP shuffling. So Daisuke knew that they needed to create something new. They needed to make a fighter that could carry on that game's legacy and bring it into a brand new era. So that's when Daisuke got the brilliant idea to step aside and let somebody else take the lead. Yeah, sorry for that misery, but I had to bring this up right at the start. Over the years, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say that Blaze Blue was made by the same guy who made Guilty Gear. 
And while Daisuke did work on the soundtrack for Blaze Blue, and he did help provide its creator with guidance during the initial development, Daisuke Ishiwatari did not create Blaze Blue. No, that was Toshimichi Mori, better known by his fans as Mori P. Mori and Daisuke had been friends for years, even before they started working together. The two of them both attended the Osaka Amusement Media School to study game design, and fun fact, the reason Mori decided to go to that school in the first place was because a pop idol he liked occasionally gave lectures there. And I just find that hilarious. I mean, imagine if the reason that Mortal Kombat came into existence was because Ed Boon and John Tobias went to college together, but they only went to that school because they thought that it would somehow help them meet Debbie Harry. And I can't find out who that idol was, but I really do wonder if she has any idea she's indirectly responsible for an entire universe of games existing. Daisuke would end up bringing Mori onto Arc Systems as an artist, working on Guilty Gear X and other fighters, even creating the fan-favorite characters of Abba and Robokai. But after so many years of working on other people's games, he decided to challenge himself to create his own. He pitched his idea to Minoru Kitaoka, the hen founder of Arc Systems, who knew that with Guilty Gear gone, it was time to create a new franchise. But the creation process of the series would be... not exactly a difficult road, but a road with many different ideas and voices. Especially when it came to the title. Together, Mori and Kitaoka agreed that the theme of the game should be blue. Quite possibly to separate itself from the overly red aesthetic of Guilty Gear. So, with that in mind, the series took on many early names, with the original title being, and I kid you not, Blue Bloods. And speaking as someone who understands English and realizes the connotations of that term in this language, holy crap did we ever dodge a bullet there. I don't think this series would have sold nearly as well if its name implied that it was all about wealthy aristocrats fighting over their inheritance. The name was eventually changed to Riot Blue, which was the title that they planned on sticking with, but apparently at the last hour, and I mean that quite literally, apparently just two days before they had to release the first arcade machines, they found out that there might be a copyright issue around Riot Blue, so they had to change it to Blaze Blue. And I think I speak for all of us when I say the better name won out. Now, when development began, both Kitaoka and Mori agreed on one thing. The new game would have to be simpler. Kitaoka thought that while Guilty Gear X was great and helped the company make a name for itself, he said that with every update, and boy were there a lot of updates, the game got more niche and the barrier for entry became higher, appealing to a smaller fan base and making it harder for new players to start. So, if this new game was going to be the beginning of a brand new franchise, it would have to be accessible enough to bring in a wider audience. And this was a sentiment that Mori agreed with, saying, I thought the Guilty Gear franchise became too difficult as a game. I wanted to simplify a lot of it, to kind of reset the fine game platform. And honestly, this wasn't a bad idea. I know that when it comes to simplifying fighting games to appeal to a wider audience, it's kind of a sore subject for the FGC. I know that most dedicated and professional players hate it, but the truth is, sometimes it does help. I've heard so many dedicated fighting game players say that all you need to bring in new players is cool characters and good visuals, and while that does certainly account for a lot, I can say as someone who exists in that weird blurry world between dedicated and casual players, yeah, I've heard so many other people in my life say they didn't get into fighting games because that barrier for entry was just too high. Hey, you wanna play a fighting game? Uh, I'm not really into fighting games. It's okay, it's okay, I'll take it easy on you. Okay, well, we can give it a shot. Cool, let's play. <laughs> wanna play again? No, I think I'm good. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't make complicated fighting games. No, not at all. But if you're making a brand new series, for a brand new console generation, and you're hoping to bring in a brand new audience, yeah, making that first game very accessible and then increasing the complexity with each later installment is probably a smart idea. But even though Kitaoka and Mori wanted to simplify the game to appeal to a wider audience, there was one decision they made that was actually kind of bold for the time and did run the risk of turning away new players. I mentioned this before, but in the mid-2000s, 2D fighters were kind of dead. If you were making a fighting game, everyone believed it had to be 3D. Who cares if 2D fighting games have their own unique charm and completely different tactics and gameplay? The PS2 and the Xbox era were the age of 3D fighters. So if you're making a fighting game, you better get on board or you're going to be left behind. But they both realized that the 2D sprite-based anime aesthetic was one of the defining appeals of their company. It's one of the things that just screams Arc System Works. So even though it was a risk, they weren't going to budge on it. 
And I'm glad they did, because these sprites look great. This became one of the best looking sprite based fighters out there. You could go frame by frame and just see how much love and attention went to bringing these characters to life. I mentioned in our Darkstalkers episode how that series would go on to inspire an entire generation of sprite based anime fighters, and Mori has admitted that Darkstalkers had a huge impact on him. And you can see that in just how lively these sprites are. You can see it in the exaggerated expressions they make in combat. I mean, whenever a character gets electrocuted, they turn into a cartoony skeleton, and that is straight out of Darkstalkers. And speaking of those characters, if you look at this cast, they might feel a little all over the place, and there's a reason for that. You see, while this was Mori's creation, Arc Systems was a tightly knit company. Rather than one person dictating every aspect of a game, instead, everyone was allowed to have a say, including in the character creation. So while Mori did create several characters himself, such as Hakuman, who he had created back in middle school and had been holding on to ever since, many of the other fighters were created by other employees at Arc Systems. For example, the big grappler of the game, Iron Tager, was made by a self-proclaimed bodybuilding fanatic at the company, and I love that. I can't help but picture some giant muscle-bound dude over at Arc System Works just going around and shoving developers into lockers until they agree to put grapplers in the game. But the important thing is that by having so many voices in the creation process, it made Blaze Blue feel kind of all over the place, but I mean that in a good way. You see, sometimes Blaze Blue can feel less like a unified world, and more like anime the fighting game. It feels like dozens of characters and ideas taken from all over the place shoved into a single world, but that was kind of its charm. It gave this game a crazy colorful variety that a lot of other fighters were lacking, and sure, to some people it might have been overwhelming, but to a certain audience, this variety in tones and designs hit just right. And this menagerie of ideas extended to the game's story, which... Oh, God, the story. Yeah, okay, as I said, I'll be talking about the actual story itself in its own video, but I do need to bring up the inclusion of the story in here because it did play into the game's development. For starters, I mentioned that Toshimichi Mori had been working at Arc Systems on Guilty Gear and some other fighters like Battle Fantasia, and he was a fan of Darkstalkers, but that doesn't mean fighting games were his first love. No, Mori has said multiple times he got into game development because he wanted to make RPGs. He wanted to create a big sprawling world with massive stories that stretched on for dozens and dozens of hours. He just kind of fell into working on fighting games because he knew Daisuke Ishiwatari and Daisuke got him to Arc Systems Works. In fact, I've actually heard from multiple people that Mori originally pitched this game to Kitaoka as an RPG, but Kitaoka wanted them to make another fighting game after losing Guilty Gear, and that's how Blaze Blue morphed into a fighting game. Now, I will admit, I haven't been able to find any actual interview where he actually says this, but when you play through the game, yeah, it certainly feels like that's real. Because every single Blaze Blue game has a massive story mode, longer than anything you had ever seen from another fine game. And this was back when story modes weren't even a given in fine games. Nobody was really thinking beyond just having a simple arcade ladder back then. However, while I'm sure that Mori pitched these story modes because he literally had been building up this story in his head since middle school and he wanted to make sure that got out there into the world in some form or fashion, he did say it was also part of his strategy for selling the game. You see, he wanted to make sure that these games had something beyond just the combat to try and bring in players. In an interview with GamesBeat, Mori said, quote, Instead of thinking of it as just a fighting game, I wanted to turn it into a single piece of content, an intellectual property. And that way, we could deploy it through many different mediums because we have a lot of cool characters here. Fighting games were still a very niche genre back then. So, it really needed to have its own identity where it would be able to translate into multiple media. And translate it did! The story of this game would become a huge selling point that would influence how the future games were released and would translate into animes and mangas and so much more. Many of which would create their own original content that would then feed back into the main series itself. Again, this was a very forward-thinking approach. Mori went into this project not just planning on creating a game, but a multimedia empire. But I'm getting ahead of myself. All the spin-offs and the side stories and the alternate reality tales and yes, that is actually a thing wouldn't come for much later. For now, it's time to finally delve into where this all began.
Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger launched in arcades in November 2008 and on home consoles in June 2009, where it was hit with a wave of praise right off the bat. It received some of the highest scores of any fighting game in the 7th gen. When it came to the combat, yes, this game was simpler compared to its Guilty Gear brethren, but as I said, that did help it appeal to a wider audience. I originally saw this game over at a friend's place, and while I had already been a big Guilty Gear fan, my friend never got into the series. But he was loving Blaze Blue, and I can tell you the simpler combat definitely helped get him hooked. He could actually understand what he was doing in this game. And speaking personally, having gone back to this game after playing the most recent installments, it is kind of jarring how different it feels from where this series would end up, but it's still incredibly fun, and it still comes with plenty of its own crazy anime fighter mechanics. Like many games at the time, you had a super meter called the Heat Gauge, and you could use 50% of that meter to use your supers, called Distortion Drives. But you also had a Barrier Gauge, and you could hold down two buttons to put up a barrier to prevent chip damage and block attacks that normally couldn't be blocked. But as you did this, you would eat up your Barrier Gauge, and if that gauge got fully depleted, then you would enter a danger state. And in this state, you would take 50% extra damage. So yeah, big reward, bigger risk. You could also hit every button at once to perform a barrier burst, which would blow your opponent back to give you some breathing room, but it would also completely destroy your barrier gauge, and I already told you why you don't want to do that. So you better think if getting out of your opponent's combo is really worth that gamble. And just like how Guilty Gear became famous for its instant kills, Blaze Blue created a similar mechanic with the Astral Heaps. However, the instant kills in Guilty Gear were easy to pull off. You just hit all the buttons at once to activate, and then you hit your opponent before the meter runs out, boom, that's it. Fairly simple for something that let you instantly win the round. But Arc Systems wanted Blaze Blue to be... What's the word I'm looking for? Oh right, not horrendously broken. So they put a ton of restrictions in here. To pull out these astral heats, you would now have to have your heat gauge at max, enough to perform two supers, and your opponent would have to have only 20% health left, meaning you could probably finish them off with just one of those supers, and you would have to be on match point, and I don't mean that if the match was first to two, then you would have to have one win already. No, that makes sense. I mean, if it was first to two, then you would have to have one win, and your opponent would also have to have one win. Yeah, if you wanted to pull off an Astral Heat, it would have to be in the last possible remaining seconds of the last possible round. That is an insanely specific situation, and while I imagine if you ever pulled it off, it would be hype as hell, I can also imagine some people probably playing through this entire game and never even knowing that this was a thing. However, here's something else really weird about the Astral Heat, and by weird, I mean flat out unfair. When this game begins, only 3 out of the 12 characters have their Astrals unlocked. All of the remaining characters can only unlock their Astrals if you beat their arcade mode. Meaning, if you decide to get this game, open it up, and then just plop down on the couch with your friend and instantly start playing against each other, there are 3 characters who just automatically have an advantage over everyone else. Sure, it's a very specific probably will never pull it off advantage, but it's an advantage nonetheless. This might be the only game I have ever heard of where it came purposely broken and you had to unlock the balance patch. And speaking of unbalanced, if you already had the character's astral unlocked and you then played through the arcade mode again, you would unlock the unlimited version of that character. These were crazy enhanced Super Saiyan versions of each character that you could only play in offline mode, which makes sense, it would be way too unfair to take the unlimited characters online. But you and your friends picking two unlimited characters and having an over-the-top crazy busted slugfest? Yeah, that's perfectly fine, go nuts. But when talking about the mechanics of Blaze Blue, what really made this series stand out was the drive ability. You see, Blaze Blue was sort of a three and a half button fighter because you had your three basic attacks, A, B, and C, essentially light, medium, and heavy, but then each character had their fourth button, the drive button, and this was a unique ability for every single character with wildly ranging effects. For example, Ragnar's drive was a large attack that would recover some of his health, Jin's drive let him freeze his opponent, and Rachel's drive wasn't even an attack. She was a character all about setting up objects and traps to mix up your opponents, so her drive let her control the wind which could push her and her props around. And just speaking personally, this drive ability is one of the best things about Blaze Blue. 
It provides so much variety to these characters. Each fighting game has a range to what their fighters can do, and to understand the game, you need to understand that range. And the range of abilities in Blaze Blue are so wide that I'm sure some people might find it exhausting, but I love it. It made every character feel new, and no matter how many fires were added to this series, I always got excited to see what they could do. I record a lot of footage of these games, and even late into the fourth installment, I still wanted to keep playing and running through the arcade with these characters because it was always a brand new experience. And I've always said that one of the best things about fighting games is that there is a character out there for everyone. No matter what your playstyle is, no matter what your taste may be, you will find that character that is for you. And with the variety in drive abilities and playstyles mixed with the creative cast of characters, Blaze Blue is the living embodiment of that mentality. And speaking of that, let's go ahead and talk about these characters. Now, as I said, I'm going to save the big details about the characters for when we actually talk about the story, but I do want to give at least a little bit of a rundown on each of them, which means that you do need a little bit of info on what the story is. This series is set in a world where a hundred years ago, a giant monster appeared called the Black Beast. It rampaged across the world for years, but eventually six heroes appeared to fight back. One of these heroes developed a new type of technology called grimoires, which allowed humans to use an artificial form of magic called Ars Magus. With these six heroes and the armies of man now using Ars Magus, humans were able to fight the beast and eventually destroyed it. Unfortunately, when the beast died, it let loose a wave of toxic gas called Seether. To survive this new poison fog spreading across the world, humans had to retreat to the tops of mountains and build brand new cities, known as hierarchical cities. After the war, a new military force known as the Novus Orbis Librarium, aka the NOL, aka the Library, declared they would decide who could and could not use Ars Magus. People rebelled against this, leading to a civil war in the land of Ikarga, resulting in the NOL killing the Ikarga leader and making themselves the police of the entire world. Now, in each hierarchical city, there's an NOL branch, and in the NOL base, there's something known as a cauldron, which serves as a gateway to a dimension between realities known as the Boundary, which is overflowing with Seether. This seems like a very dangerous thing to constantly be tapping into, but since Seether powers the NOL's grimoires, that's why they keep these cauldrons running. But it's also because they believe that at the center of the boundary is the most concentrated form of Seether imaginable, known as the Azure. Which is said to be so powerful that if you got your hands on it, you could reshape reality. So, now that we've got all that established, who are our fighters? Our protagonist is Ragnar the Blood Edge. When he was a boy growing up in an orphanage, his arm was cut off by his brother Jin, his sister was abducted, and his home was burned to the ground. So yeah, he's got a lot of baggage. His life was then saved by Jubei, a talking cat who, despite his size and appearance, was one of the six legendary heroes from a hundred years ago. Jubei then replaces Ragnar's arm with the Azure Grimoire, said to be one of the strongest grimoires imaginable with the power to, as you can probably guess, tap into the Azure itself. Ragnar now travels the world trying to bring down the NOL by destroying their cauldrons. Next up is Ragnar's rival, his aforementioned brother Jin, who not only joined the NOL, but even killed Ikarga's leader and was hailed as the hero of the Ikarga War. He's a high-ranking officer in the NOL and is always very serious and professional, but he's also a complete a-hole who treats everyone around him like trash, and the moment he hears his brother is headed to the cauldron in the city of Kagatsuchi, he loses his mind, goes AWOL, and becomes obsessed with tracking him down. Working under Jin is the final part in our trio of heroes, Noelle Vermillion. She was an orphan who doesn't remember much about her past, but despite being such a punching bag in the series that's actually kind of pathetic at times... <laughs> Give her back! Please! Those are important! They're really important to me, so please! Give them back! No. She is incredibly skilled at Ars Magus and even possesses a set of guns that are some of the most powerful grimoires on the planet. Next up, the big grappler of the game, Iron Dagger. He's a mountain of a man who's all about business and all about carrying out his missions, and he works for a super scientist named Kokonoi, who is part of Sector 7. Sector 7 is a group of scientists who oppose the NOL. I personally love Tager, not just because he comes off as a good dude, but also because he's a grappler whose drive ability allows you to magnetize the opponent and pull them in. Just saying that sentence alone is enough to give some people nightmares. 
There's Bang Shishigami, a ninja from Ikariga who is trying to help other survivors from that war. He's got a big heart and he cares about everyone, but he's also kind of an idiot at times and he often gets used as a source of comedy. Carl Clover is a vigilante who hunts down criminals alongside the giant doll that accompanies him, and as I'm sure many of you can guess, he is a puppet fighter who controls his doll with his drive button. He also refers to this doll as his sister, which will be important later. Next is Rachel Alucard, a vampire who, despite her appearance, is actually hundreds of years old and has helped to guide Ragna in his quest for years, even though her superiority complex frames all of her help through insults. Lychee Fei Ling is a doctor working in Kagutsuchi, the city where the first game takes place, but she has a mysterious history that largely revolves around our next fighter, Arachne. This blob of darkness and insects used to be a scientist working for Sector 7, but he became so obsessed with finding the Azure inside the barrier that he fell inside of it and... Well, yeah, this is why you don't want to expose yourself to too much Seether. It tends to make Cronenbergs happen. Then there's Tao Kaka. She's part of a race of cat people called the Kaka Clan, and despite being the protector of said clan, she basically acts like a hyperactive kid who just wants to eat. Hakumin was one of the six legendary heroes who fought against the Black Beast, and now, for some reason, he is obsessed with the idea of murdering Ragna. Wow, him and Jin have a whole lot in common. I bet they'd get along great. He's also one of the more unique fighters in this early game, as he uses his own special meter for all of his moves that slowly builds up on his own, which admittedly can make doing some combos very complicated, but he deals massive damage, so it is worth that work. And lastly, the boss of the game, New 13. She's what's known as a Murokumo unit, a type of android designed to go into the boundary. She's super robotic and emotionless. Unless she's fighting Ragna, then she becomes an obsessed fangirl. Also, she's made of like 90% knives and swords, and she fights like the most zonery zoner in fighting game history. And that is your roster and premise for Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger. Okay, I know that was a lot, but I promise that's about the most story you're going to get in this episode. If you could listen to all that without your head exploding like that guy from Scanners, then congrats. Yes, folks, this series plot is complicated, and the world of Blaze Blue already has a massive wall of lore as soon as the story begins, and about seven more walls of lore that won't be revealed until later games, even though they start referencing those later walls of lore in the very first game. I mentioned that Mori P started thinking up these characters in this series back in middle school, and this series totally has that vibe of story you thought up 20 years ago and you kept adding onto it in your head for years before you actually wrote any of it out. And to everyone who thinks I'm being too harsh on the story, even Mori himself said this story is a jumbled mess. In an interview with Red Bull in 2017, Mori was asked about his inspiration in creating this story, and he said, and I quote, Actually, I just created a world combining a lot of things that interest me. Though I admit in hindsight, it was probably difficult at times for players to follow along. And speaking as someone who had to figure out this story for this retrospective, I would like to respond to that comment with an overly sarcastic, No! The hell you say! But I want to make something clear. As crazy complicated and flat out incomprehensive as this story can get at times, it is still totally possible to enjoy these characters without knowing anything about the plot. I had several people talk to me while I was working on this video saying they don't understand the story at all, but they still have a close attachment to these characters because their personalities and their relationships still manage to come through even if you don't understand the basis for it. And I totally get that. I had zero idea what the plot Blaze Blue was until like two years ago, but I still really enjoyed these characters because these games give them so much personality, whether that be in the actual story mode itself or in the combat. There are so many unique interactions between specific characters when they fight, whether that be unique in-round dialogue between characters or in the intro animations. And I mentioned the unique voice lines, and that's something else that I have to bring up about these characters. The voice acting in Japanese is great. I think the actors each nail their characters, especially Tomokaza Sugita, who plays Ragna and brings a gruff, beaten-down anger to that role. But this was one of the first times that I ever heard a Japanese fighting game get not just an English dub, but an actual good English dub. Yeah, at this time, if a Japanese fighting game got an English dub, it was typically pretty bad. But Blaze Blue had an all-star cast of some of the biggest dub actors out there, and they each brought their A-game to this. Mel Lee brought this elegance and snobbishness to Rachel that made her seem wise beyond her appearance. 
Jamison Price gave Tager this stoic all-business attitude. Philly Sampler, who sadly passed away recently, gave Tao Kaka so much energy and charm. Patrick Sipes as Ragna nailed every over-the-top attack that he had to shout out, and I gotta applaud David Vincent, who probably blew out all of his vocal cords every time that he had to say, I get to kill you again! Let's kill each other! Ragna! No one else can kill you! The hero of Akarga, everybody. Don't get me wrong, I know there are some people out there who still prefer the Japanese track, and that's totally fine. But it's been my experience that the Blaze Blue English dub has been one of the most positively received dubs in fighting game history. And I think a lot of that is because this cast understood the assignment. No matter what insane thing they had to say, they gave it their all. Listen, you heard the brief plot synopsis I gave? Well, the full version is about 20 times more complicated with 50 more made up nouns and verbs. So I guarantee most of this cast didn't know what anything they were saying meant. But they still delivered those lines like they did, and God bless them for that. And they had to record a lot of lines for this because... Well, it's time that we finally talk about that story mode. Again, not really in terms of the plot, but in terms of the structure. Because this wasn't just a massive story mode, it was also a very different type of story mode. Every single character has their own story, but those stories can diverge in different ways. You'll be given choices to make which can determine where the story goes, but you can also change your path by losing certain fights or finishing fights with supers. And as a result, each character has around three different endings that you can get. And here's the crazy thing. Every single one of these endings contains some bit of information that is going to help you fill in this story. I mentioned the plot Blaze Blue is super thick and hard to comprehend, but I gotta say, playing through each story and getting all the different endings was actually fun because each time that I got an ending, I went, wait, so they said this thing here, and in this character's ending, they said that thing, and those two things can mean this third thing. Playing through the story mode gave me that satisfaction of putting a puzzle together when you get those two good pieces that finally match up. In fact, you even sometimes get important bits of information from losing a match. And I don't mean the story-related losses that send you off in a different direction. No, I mean the fights that you're not supposed to lose. Every time that you lose a match, whether you were supposed to or not, you get unique dialogue and sometimes that can give you another piece of this puzzle. Which brings me to the other reason why I play through this story so many times. Each time that you get one of the endings or you take a new route in the character's story, you'll see the completion percentage go up. And if I see a completion counter going up, it causes my brain to start sparking and I have to see it all the way through. Unfortunately, you don't get 100% by fighting all the fights and getting all the endings. You get 100% by fighting all the fights, getting all the endings, and losing to every single character and seeing their unique loss dialogue. And what do you get for all that work? Well, I'm happy to say there actually is a completion bonus in this game. If you 100% a character's story, then you unlock a short interview with that character's voice actor. That's actually kind of neat. So, this is a Ragna, and the game is a little bit of a story mode. So, what is this? What is this? What is this? Granted, the interview is with the Japanese voice actor and isn't subtitled, so this really meant nothing to me, but hey, at least it's something. That's more than a lot of other fine games would do. Now, there is something else you unlock when you play through the story mode, although it's not really a bonus, more of a necessity. If you're playing through the story mode and you're getting confused by the tidal wave of new terms and vaguely referenced history that's being thrown your way, then you will unlock a mode called Teach Me Miss Lychee. This is a feature where the game explains to you what certain terms mean, give you context to the history they keep referencing, it's the kind of thing that a series like this needs. And how they convey all this information? Through sketch comedy, of course, how else would they do it? Yeah, the setup for this is that Lychee and Tao Kaka are meeting other characters who try to teach Tao, but only after you sit through several minutes of them goofing around. Don't get me wrong, there is a charm to this, and hearing the characters actually explain historical events is more effective than just reading it on a wiki, but it was a bit annoying that I went into this wanting to learn what a hierarchical city was, and they would only tell me after sitting through a five minute bit about Noel's friend getting stuck in a tree. Guys, I'm putting a retrospective together over here, I'm on the clock, let's get a move on it! Now, once you've been in every character's story mode at least once and gotten one of their endings, then you unlock the true ending. A true ending that leaves off on a massive cliffhanger. A massive cliffhanger that makes pretty much zero sense to you right now, but hey, that just shows how far ahead Mori had planned the story out. I mean, I'll admit, yes, a lot of the stuff you hear in this story mode is going to sound like pure nonsense flowing into word soup, 
but after playing through every game story and then going back and reviewing this, I gotta admit, so much in this story that sounds like gibberish actually was referencing stuff that would be explained two or three games later. It's kind of wild how much was said from the start, and even wilder that Arxis believed in this brand new game enough that they were willing to leave it on a big to be continued. I mean, they didn't know how audiences would react to this, what if it bombed? Well, luckily, this brand new venture paid off. I mentioned that the game received very positive reviews, but that doesn't necessarily always translate to sales. I mean, you can have the greatest game on the market, doesn't mean much if nobody buys it. Well, much to the delight of Arxis, people did buy it. A lot! In the first three years, Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger sold 1.7 million copies, which if this was Capcom or Bandai Namco, that would be a disappointment. Good thing this was not Capcom or Bandai Namco. No, this was Arc Systems, and for them, this was one of the biggest successes they had ever had. As I said, their Guilty Gear games brought in critical praise and a diehard fan base, but they never brought in much money. And while all the numbers for their games aren't readily available, from what I've been able to tell, it looks like Blaze Blue went on to sell more than every version of Guilty Gear X and X2 combined, and trust me, that's a lot of versions. Just to give you an idea of what a big boom this was for Arxis, the last Guilty Gear game to come out before this was Double X Accent Core, and that sold 40,000 copies in Japan in its entire lifespan. Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger sold 60,000 copies in Japan in its first month. And these sales can largely be attributed to all the points that I've already laid out. The designs, the accessible combat, the story, but quite possibly the biggest boom Blaze Blue got came from something that was completely outside of the dev's control, but the secret to success for so many titles. It's the thing that can make or break any release. Timing. You remember how I said that it was a risk to make this a 2D fighter when it was at a time when studios were leaning heavily into 3D? Well, just a few months before Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger released in arcades and on home consoles, Street Fighter 4 was released. And while it used 3D models instead of sprites, it was a return to 2D combat. And it exploded. People loved this game, and as a result, 2D fighting games saw a massive surge in popularity. People were demanding more 2D fighters, and studios were ready to jump at this. But it takes time to make a new game. No way would anyone be able to get anything ready for at least another year. But Blaze Blue had already been in the works and was released just a few months later, making it line up perfectly to take advantage of this new fighting game boom. I'm sure the game still would have sold well no matter when it was released, but yeah, there's no denying that gamers racing to stores suddenly looking for 2D fighters at the exact time that Blaze Blue was released probably helped a lot. And these rising sales and this sudden surge in the fighting game genre was all Arxis needed to greenlight a sequel. Blaze Blue Continuum Shift released in arcades in November of 2009, exactly one year after the last arcade release, and only five months after the home console release. This was a hell of a turnaround. How did they get a sequel out that fast? Well, that was thanks to the magic of reused assets. Yes, this is one of the things that I really miss from the day and age of sprite-based fighters. The idea that we could get a brand new installment so quickly because you could just pick up the sprites from the last game and put them in the new game. You didn't have to rebuild everything from scratch leading to a stressful production, and it gave the developers much more time to focus on balancing and improving the gameplay, which the developers did. A lot. Every single character got brand new moves, giving them more options in combat. And this right here, this is one of the best things about Blaze Blue. Every single game from this point on would take what the previous game had made and added onto it. Each game gave characters new moves and mechanics, while rarely, if ever, removing something from them. And when they did, they would typically replace it with something else. You remember how I said if you want to start a brand new franchise, it's not a bad idea to make it accessible to large audiences and then make it more complex with each new installment? Yeah, that starts here. 
Because of this, it's almost universally agreed upon that this series got better with each installment. You ask someone what's the best Street Fighter, you're gonna get a lot of different answers. You ask someone what's the best Tekken, you're gonna get a lot of different answers. You ask someone what's the best Blaze Blue, almost everyone is going to say the fourth one. But that's not to say it's still not worth going back and replaying these older games. I still have blast going back and revisiting these games, and it was fun seeing how this series developed and grew over time. Now, as for these adjustments to the mechanics, one of the big ones comes from the burst. Now, if you burst, it no longer depletes your gauge. Instead, each player has only one burst that they can use in the match. But if you lose a round, then you can get an extra burst. However, that burst icon isn't just used for defense. You also now need to have a free burst in order to do your astral heat. Yes, there is yet another stipulation to point off your insta-kills. You now can't use your burst throughout the match if you want to make it happen. But they did ease up on a few of the other restrictions. Now you just have to be on point match for yourself, not for both players. And you can now pull off your astral heat when your opponent is at 35% health, which is way better. At 20% health, the insta-kills were just there for bragging rights. 35% actually makes them feel powerful, like something that was worth 100% of your meter. As for the remaining balances and gameplay changes, there's a lot of small tweaks, but the important thing to point out is that the combo system was reworked so that the opponents would be pushed back less, allowing for bigger combos, and yeah, you can totally feel that. The level of crazy combo nuttiness definitely jumped up from the last game. Even someone like me who can barely make his thumbs work could feel the difference. Now, when it comes to the characters, as I said, everyone from the last game returned, but there were three new characters. Well, more like two and a half new characters. There's Tsubaki Yayoi. She's one of Noelle's close friends from the military academy and a childhood friend of Jin and has a not-so-subtle crush on him. She's professional and mature beyond her years, but when Jin goes AWOL looking for Ragna and Noelle disappears looking for Jin, the NOL tells Tsubaki that she has to hunt down her two friends and kill them. She doesn't want to do it, but she was raised believing the NOL is always right and that she should always do her duty, so she reluctantly agrees. Well, that and she is using an ancient grimoire that's kind of devouring her mind. One of my favorite things about doing these retrospectives is that it forces me to play characters I would normally never touch, and I never had any interest in playing Tsubaki, but after actually getting my hands on her, she became one of my favorite characters to play. She's got super easy combos, she's got an overhead that launches you into the air, and she has EX versions of all of her moves that are charged up by holding down your drive button, giving her some really good variety. Then there's Lambda-11. She was another Murakumo unit who had been salvaged by Kokonoi, the mad sassy scientist that Tager works for. And while she does have her own backstory that's really damn tragic, we all know why she's here. They didn't want to lose any characters, but New-13 was destroyed at the end of Calamity Trigger, so Lambda-11 is just New-13 with a different coat of paint. And lastly, there's the big villain in the game, Hazuma. He was the captain in the NOL who had secretly been pulling everyone's strings behind the scenes, manipulating them for his own plans, because of course he was. I've seen enough Bleach to know you don't trust a guy who looks like this. Once again, I enjoy the entire English voice cast for this new game, but I have to give a particular shout out to Eric Davies, who made Hazuma sound like a cross between a schoolyard bully asking if you're gonna cry, and a 1980s Wall Street exec who's coked out of his mind. Oh, little upset? I know how you feel. It's pretty rough watching someone just pluck up all the things that are important to you and turn them into something horrible right before your eyes. I feel for you. I do. But oh my god, is this fun for me! Especially your despair! <gasps> so divine! After this game, however, Davies would be replaced by Doug Earhold, but he also did a great job. I seriously didn't even know they changed actors until researching this video. Hazuma also serves as the final boss in the arcade ladder, and this is one of the most frustrating fights in this entire series, because not only does Hazuma use snake whips to snatch you out of the air and whip and dip and zip all around the stage, but you're not fighting regular Hazuma, you're fighting unlimited Hazuma. Meaning as soon as the match begins, he surrounds himself with a ring of energy, and as long as that ring stays up, he heals back his life, and if you step inside that ring, you get poisoned and you lose life. So if you start attacking, but he keeps blocking, you're just going to end up doing damage to yourself. Oh yeah, Hazma is pure evil in both the story and in combat. He's so evil that you do his insta-kill with pretzel motions, and if SNK has taught me anything, it's that only the most sinister of villains use pretzel motions. However, those are the characters that got added to the arcade release. The next year, in July of 2010, the game came to home consoles. And if you're wondering why it took almost a year for the game to move from the arcade to consoles, 
It's because remember, when it comes to the combat, there were only technically two new characters and a handful of new moves and balance changes. Everything else was reused assets. The home console release? That's where the new content started pouring in. And before we go any further, I should let y'all know right now, Continuum Shift gets a little... Let's say Street Fighter 2-y with its releases. There was the initial port, then there was Continuum Shift 2 for the PSP and 3DS, and finally Continuum Shift Extend, which is basically the complete edition, and each game added brand new content. Sticking with the characters, Continuum Shift came to consoles with the same roster as the arcade, plus the brand new unlockable character, Moo12, who... Okay, at the risk of getting too deep into the plot right now, let's just say she's another Murokumo unit who has some kind of a connection to Noel, and I won't spoil much more beyond that. She's a very unique character, and her drive places drones all around the stage that you can then manipulate to send out attacks. Also, while Hazuma is still the technical final boss of the game, she now serves as the secret final boss. If you manage to get all the way through the arcade without losing any matches, then you get to fight her. But you only have one shot to beat her, and yeah, you might need more than one shot. She's pretty tough. Now, that was the only new character at Lawns, but they did release multiple DLC characters. Platinum the Trinity, who is a young girl that looks like a Sailor Scout, but she's actually got two souls inside of her. A young shy boy named Cinna, and a foul-mouthed troublemaking girl named Luna. Plus a third soul that lives in her staff, Trinity Glassfield, who was another one of the six legendary heroes. She's kind of what I would describe as a crab bag character. Her drive lets her summon out random new weapons to use, which can make learning her a little bit difficult since you don't know what you're going to get next, but each of her weapons are goofy and fun, so I'm cool with it. Also, I have to point this out. Platinum's default stage is called Bascule, and this is one of the best stages in the entire game for one simple reason. It's the stage that gave us the Hype Dog. <laughs> Yes, this big mouth furball is going to constantly be in the background throughout the entire match, cheering you on with his repetitive barks, and I love it. I mentioned that Mori said that he was a big Darkstalkers fan and that series left an impact on him. This has to be a reference to the cheering dog in Bishamon stage back in the old Darkstalkers games. This has to be an Easter egg of sorts. But whether or not it's completely original or is inspired by Darkstalkers, the fan base loves Hype Dog. This has become one of the most beloved figures in this entire game. Heck, it's become one of the most beloved figures for Arc Systems in general. People love the Hype Dog. Don't mess with me again! Speaking of dogs, getting back to the characters, Valkenhain R. Helsing is next. He's Rachel's butler who is fiercely loyal to her, and he's also a werewolf and his dry button gives him the ability to transform. And guess what? He was also one of the six legendary heroes. Yeah, we're starting to fill in that legendary hero bingo card real quick, aren't we? And the final DLC character was Makoto Nanaya, another classmate of Noelle and Tsubaki's, and a huge fan favorite character. She's perky, energetic, upbeat, she's basically the power of friendship personified. You may also have known she's a squirrel girl, because yes, animal people are a thing in this universe, and she punches things incredibly hard. When this game was coming out, being the huge comic book fan that I was, I couldn't help but draw very clear comparisons between her and Marvel's unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Marvel vs. Arc System works, just throwing it out there, make it happen, Daisuke. Her drive ability lets you hit the opponent with three different levels of punches depending on how long you hold the button down, and all of her supers are hilariously over the top. They are low with so much personality, I love them. Also, I have to point out that Makoto may have the craziest origin story of any character in this roster. Not in terms of lore or in-game story, no, I mean in terms of development. In an interview with 4Gamer, Toshi Michimori was promoting an upcoming Blaze Blue manga, The Blood Edge Experience, alongside the manga's author, Mako Komao. The interviewer brought the fact that Komao had written a lot of romances between women in mangas before, and they asked if Mori had any plans on adding a romance like that to Blaze Blue. Mori then revealed that originally, Tsubaki was going to be a lesbian who was deeply in love with Noelle. But he said he got about halfway through the script and said it just wasn't working out. So, he rewrote Tsubaki to now be in love with Jin, but then he looked at Noelle and Tsubaki and said, well, now these two don't have anything in common, why are they even hanging out? So, at the last minute, he just sketched up a squirrel girl and threw her in there to basically just be the person who keeps Noelle and Tsubaki talking to each other. I love Makoto, and I'm glad that she exists, but it is wild to think that is how this fan favorite and very important character to the plot came into existence. But looking back on it, it's kind of obvious that she was an afterthought. 
In Calamity Trigger, she's just a goofy, ditzy friend of the other two girls, while in Continuum Shift and Beyond, she's a badass interject punching machine. So it's kind of clear that Mori didn't really have any ideas for her until the second game. But Makoto wasn't the only character to get some personality tweaking in this game. I mentioned that when it comes to the gameplay, this is when Blaze Blue really became Blaze Blue for me. But that also goes for the characters. In the first game, sure, some characters were here for fun, but most of them were pretty serious. I mean, Ragno was just every dark bad boy edgelord that you drew in your high school notebook. But starting with Continuum Shift, this series had a much needed chunk of comedy. Don't get me wrong, there were characters in the last game like Bang and Tao who were definitely meant to be funny. But now, almost everyone had a sense of humor behind them. Especially Ragna. He's now throwing out one-liners and he has a far more relatable I am so done with everyone's nonsense attitude about him. In other words, they took Ragna from generic edgy protag and turned him into anime Bruce Campbell. And I for one am okay with that. Hey, Team Gothic Lolita, you want to include me in the conversation? Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. I swear, I've never seen this little ragamuffin before in my life. You gotta understand, man. I, I never even saw these assholes before. Once she'd finally come to her senses, Madam Rachel rewarded my bravery with this. A ribbon. I don't care! I feel like this was the game that kind of got the tone of Blaze Blue because part of the appeal of this series is that it's a story about souls and gods and life and death and loss and angst and torment. But it's being told by people who realize how weird this is and they're not afraid to take the piss out of it. And nowhere is that more clear than in the gag endings. Yes, story mode returns and we'll delve into that in a moment, but every character now had multiple endings again including a designated gag ending, and these gag endings are insane in the best way. In the story mode, you'll come to a point where you'll be given a choice, and one of those choices will lead you to the gag ending. And these are like 10 to 15 minute long skits that are some of the wackiest things I can imagine, but they are hilarious. Listen, I know the Teach Me Miss Lychee stuff was supposed to be funny, but it never worked on me. I just didn't really enjoy it all that much. These gag endings, on the other hand, Almost all of them made me audibly laugh out loud. I had only planned on getting two or three of them to show off in this video, but then I watched a 15 minute long skit about Ragna on a ghost ship and I laughed so hard at, I need to see all of them. That's right, Captain Jin of the HMS Nirvana, lowly tuna fishing vessel. Captain Ragna did not attack your ship because he was after the Crimson Grimoire. He panicked because he was afraid of ghosts. I, Captain Jin of the lowly tuna fishing vessel, HMS Nirvana. Ragna just like panicked like the little sissy mayor he is when he found out you were a ghost. Although, speaking of the comedy, I debated whether or not I should address this, but the point of these retrospectives is to give you an accurate summation of the series, so there's no way I could ignore this. When it comes to the comedy of Blaze Blue, there is one joke that this series loves returning to over and over again. Booby lady! Hey you! Boobzilla! Miss Lychee came to us with her wondrous breasts. Mm, they're not nearly as big and fluffy as they appear. Oh, or did you already fill your flat-chested chick quota for the series? Boobs are the foundation society is built upon. Boobs equal power. Hey, puppeteer mask! Why are all you guys so hung up on back-breaking boobs anyhow? Ah, would you look at the time. Until next time, magical girls, I bid you adieu. Yeah, if I had to describe the tone of Blaze Blue, I'd say it's one part high fantasy, one part mid-2000s anime, one part edgy street attitude, one part Japanese mythology, and one part the author's barely disguised fetish. This game loves its boob jokes. Mori P loves boobs like the Street Fighter VI devs love feet. Mori P loves boobs so much that when researching this video, I found an interview with Famitsu where they actually ask him about how much he brings up boobs, and rather than trying to downplay it, he proceeded to pull out his boob tier list and start ranking all the characters in the game. And I'm not judging, it's his game, he can put in here whatever he wants, and hell, I'll admit, I laughed at a good chunk of these jokes. But in case you're thinking about checking these games out, yeah, I figured I should probably warn y'all not to play them around grandma and grandpa this holiday season. Then again, I don't know your grandma and grandpa, maybe they're cool with it, use your best judgment. Now, when it comes to the single player content, this game introduced a new mode called Legion, 
which first appeared in the PSP version of Calamity Trigger, but this was its first time appearing on a home console version. This is a really clever mode where you pick a character, then you challenge other fighters across a map, and each time that you beat a group of characters, you then get to pick one of them to join your team. But every time that one of your fighters is KO'd, that's it, they're gone. It's basically the fighting game equivalent of a Nuzlocke, and I think it's brilliant. It's a fairly simple challenge, but deciding what characters you want to join or which characters you might have to sacrifice sending them out there against a big team gives it enough strategy to make it a unique experience. There's so many other games out there that could benefit from something like this. I mean, KOF, you're already a team-based game. This is an easy setup for you. How did BlazBlue beat you to this? Now as for the story mode itself, once again, every single character has their own unique story mode, but luckily, this time to unlock the true ending, you do not need to finish everyone's story, and to get 100%, you don't have to lose all the matches. Oh, right. You don't have to lose on purpose to get 100% completion? I guess that really pissed people off last time. No! The hell you say! <clears throat> Sorry. As I was saying, to unlock the true ending, then you just had to get the correct ending for Ragna, Noel, Jin, Rachel, Subaki, Hakuman, and Hazma, then the true ending opens. However, I will repeat, you have to get the correct ending for them. Because, as I mentioned, there are three different endings for every single character. The gag ending, as we already talked about, then there is the true canon ending, and then there is essentially the bad ending. And while some of these bad endings are actually pretty cool, you can't beat the game if you get them. So how do you figure out how to get the correct ending? Well, that would be thanks to the brand new segment, Help Me, Professor Kokonoi! Yes, the Teach Me Miss Lighty series does return, but so does a brand new segment in the same vein, where Kokonoi will come out and try to vaguely give you hints about how to unlock the true ending. As I said, I wasn't really a big fan of Teach Me Miss Lighty, but I actually dig these Kokonoi segments. They're charming, you've got a few good laughs in here, and they're much shorter and to the point. Plus, Kokonoi is just a fun character. I respect anyone in a crazy sci-fi fantasy saying who's tired of everyone else's nonsense. Now, I mentioned that this game had multiple installments, and each of them did provide something different. First up, Continuum Shift 2 was an update that you could download for the base version, but it was also the version that was released on the PSP and the 3DS. I decided to check it out on the 3DS because around this time every fighting game wanted to make a special version just for the 3DS, but most of them would heavily use the bottom touchscreen, such as Street Fighter, which let you just touch the screen on the bottom in order to do moves. But Continuum Shift 2 is just regular Blaze Blue, and it plays about as well as you could possibly imagine Blaze Blue running on a 3DS. You could actually do the same combos in here that you could do on the home console, and that's actually kind of impressive. But the biggest thing that I have to give the 3DS version is the thing that sadly I can't actually show you. It's the 3D, which is shockingly good. Blaze Blue already used multiple layers for its backgrounds, so when they put it on the 3DS, they just made it so that when you raise the 3D filter, it separates the layers, and it looks great. Again, I can't actually show you that because it's impossible to capture the 3D effect from a 3DS, but trust me, it's pretty cool. But the big thing that's worth mentioning about Continuum Shift 2 was that all the DLC characters were included as unlockables, and they introduced a brand new mode, Abyss Mode. In this mode, you have to make your way through the hierarchical city of Kagatsuchi, starting at floor 1, and going all the way down to either floor 100, 500, or 999, depending on the difficulty that you set, battling through enemies all the way down. Now don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that you have to fight almost a thousand opponents, no. As you fight, you'll see a counter going up, showing what floor you're on, with your performance deciding how quickly you move through it. Then whenever you hit a floor divisible by 20, you're transported to a boss fight against an extra beefy opponent. But when you defeat them, you get to pick one of four buffs. These buffs can be anything from increasing your stats, to regenerating your life bar, giving you an extra burst, weakening your opponent, it's kinda nuts how much they gave you to unlock. Then whenever you try to start a brand new run, you can go into the shop and purchase any of the previous buffs that you already unlocked to start your run with. When I checked this mode out, I thought it was just going to be a fancy version of survival mode, but I was delighted to find that I was wrong. It's not survival mode, it's Hades! This is a roguelike where the point is to see how good of a run you can get by picking up buffs along the way and unlocking ways to improve your future runs, and I got hooked on this! Getting buffs was always such a rush, and thinking of ways to make myself stronger for the next run was so addictive! And I know some people might have problems with the fact that whenever you start a brand new run, if you want to start it with buffs, you have to spend the in-game currency to unlock those buffs. 
But to me, all that did was just rank up the tension. It put stakes on it. Sure, I could now get these buffs, but if I didn't make it all the way through this ladder this time, that meant I just wasted some of the in-game currency. It's risk and reward, and it made every victory so satisfying, and it made every defeat just make me want to get right back in there. And I want to point this out for a second. I talk a lot on this channel about the importance of single player content in your fighting games, but a lot of people hear that and they think, oh, but single player content is hard. It costs tons of money and time to come up with a big cinematic story mode. And to that I say, then don't do a big cinematic story mode. Use your brain and come up with some unique and interesting single player modes that use the assets already in the game. And Legion mode and Abyss mode are perfect examples of that. And the Abyss mode carried over to the final version of the game, Continuum Shift Extend. However, for some weird reason, they got rid of Legion mode? I have no idea why you would remove modes from the complete version of your game when they were both available on the previous version of your game. That makes zero sense to me. But they did replace it with a brand new single player mode called Unlimited Mars, where you face off with super powered unlimited versions of your opponents. This is the final challenge. It's the mode made just for those who have mastered the game and are the true ultimate warrior. <laughs> Which I am not. You will not be seeing a lot of unlimited Mars in this video. My apologies. But the main draw of the extended version was tons of new story content including story modes for all the DLC characters, a few side stories, and even bonus dialogue in the pre-existing storylines. That's actually wild that it went back and updated the story that was already in the previous games. But I have to bring this up. You can tell the team on the English side were being pushed hard to get the extra content out on time. Because in Extend, there are tons of problems with the translation and the dub that were not in the base game. You'll see typos. Text boxes completely different from what's being said. God damn it, old man. I know you're trying to hold back that laugh. Completely blank text boxes. The grimoires were created to fight the Black Beast, but we've learned plenty of ways that Ars Magus can be used for less military applications. And most bizarre of all, multiple times I encountered the game just switching to the Japanese audio out of nowhere. As you know, the birth rate of males among the Kaka clan is very low and the village's population has never exceeded 100. There's no reason to think that will change in the near future. Kakazuku I said these story modes were huge, so the English team being told, hey, guess what? You have to write all of that stuff you just wrote again, plus extra stuff, must have just been too much. I can only imagine how hard they were crunching to get this out on time. But there was one more addition making Extend the true best version of the game. An additional new character, Relius Clover. He's a sociopathic mad scientist who serves as one of the biggest villains in the franchise, and he's obsessed with knowledge and specializes in building puppets and high-tech machines, such as the Morokumo units. And in case you're wondering, hey, wait, he uses puppets just like Carl, and they even have the same last name. Yes, this is Carl Clover's father, and if you want to know how evil Relius is, well, remember how Carl kept calling his robot partner sister? Yeah. I'm just gonna let you guys think about that one for a sec. Now, with each game, the sales figures did become a little bit hard to figure out, but looking at the physical sales numbers, it looks like the game sold about as many copies as Calamity Trigger, while costing much less to make thanks to all the reused assets. In other words, this was another hit for Arc System Works. So, they got to work on the next installment, which would be their biggest game yet.
Blaze Blue Chrono Phantasma would release in arcades in November 2012 and it would continue Arx's quest to make the weirdest title in fighting games history. Just like Continuum Shift, Chrono Phantasma saw several balance changes, new moves, and additions to the gameplay. For starters, you can now spin a quarter of your heat gauge to do a guard break, and I love this addition. Nothing feels quite as good as hitting your opponent who won't stop blocking with a guard break and then comboing that right into a super. But easily the biggest addition was Overdrive. This is a rechargeable ability that is triggered by hitting all four buttons. This will send you into Overdrive mode, where your character would receive multiple buffs. But not basic stuff that you would expect, like increased speed and strength. No, in Overdrive mode, every single character gets some kind of a unique buff that leans into their playstyle. For example, remember how I said Taker has the ability to magnetize the opponent? Well, normally after you magnetize them, you have to hit the Drive button to pull them into you. But in Overdrive, they're just getting vacuumed right into you at all times. Makoto can hit her Drive to do three different punches depending on how long you hold the button down. But in Overdrive, that punch is at max strength at all times. Relius normally burns up a special meter whenever he's using his puppet, but in Overdrive, that meter gradually recovers. I love the Overdrive system because not only does it reward you for knowing your character inside and out, but I said that the Drive system helps make every single character feel like they come from a completely different game, and the Overdrive system leans even further into that. And in addition to this, the Overdrive also grants you another more basic yet still very satisfying buff. While in Overdrive, all your supers are enhanced into more powerful versions. So even if you're picking up a brand new character and you haven't learned them yet, use that Overdrive and enjoy your new and improved Overdrive finish. Or don't use the Overdrive and hold on to it and save it to get the enemy off you because your Overdrive is also now how you do your bursts. Yes, they once again decided to tinker around with the burst mechanic, but you know what? I think they finally nailed it. You now have to decide, do I want to get the opponent off of me or do I want to do extra damage? Fighting games are all about choices, and Overdrive is great for that. There were also other tweaks to make the combat quicker, but perhaps my favorite update for this game? Your heat gauge increases way faster. Real talk, when recording this video, it was hard for me to get some of those astral finishers in the previous games, because my meter just would not build fast enough. I actually got time over in some matches trying to get 100% meter, because it just rose that slowly. But now? Yeah, there's no problem. Your meter rises nice and quick. Heck, I even got enough meter in some matches to do a super, and then I still had enough by the end of the match to do the insta-kill. And thanks to the quicker and smoother combat, it makes comboing into your finishers way easier. So yeah, I don't know if you can tell from the tone of my voice, but I like this game. I love the combat. I said that each installment of Blaze Blue improved the gameplay, and sure, I like Calamity Trigger, I enjoyed Continuum Shift, but once we hit Chrono Phantasma, I was head over heels for this game. It was actually hard for me to put this game down and then move on to the next one because I just wanted to keep playing this. But the combat wasn't the only thing to see a huge leap from the last game. As I said, Continuum Shift launched with only two new characters. Three if you count Lambda. But Chrono Phantasma featured several new additions. First up is Azrael, one of the big villains of the series. He's an insanely strong criminal who's obsessed only with fighting, and when it comes to the lore, he might be the most OP character in the entire series. Like, he's so strong he can rip through reality just by flexing his muscles. Then there's Izayoi. Remember how I said that Tsubaki was using an ancient grimoire that was kind of eating her brain? Yeah, this is her after becoming completely possessed by that grimoire and turned into sort of a holy futuristic executioner. Then there's Amani Nishiki, a dancer who leads a traveling theater troupe and fights with scarves and wraps that turn to drills. They're a very mysterious character, constantly appearing in places that they shouldn't be with knowledge that they shouldn't have. We'll talk about them more when we cover the story. And speaking of the story, our last character is Bullet. A character who the Blaze Blue fandom constantly dunks on for being the least important character to the plot. Yeah, Bullet's importance to the story is the source of constant jokes from the fan base, but I gotta take umbrage with that. Bullet was a member of a group of mercenaries, and her entire squad was wiped out but she hears that her captain may still be alive at Sector 7 and she's out to find him. Hmm, how mysterious. I wonder who it could possibly be. So yeah, she doesn't actually play into the overall plot. I mean, heck, there is a moment in the story where she is hanging out with another character who is very important to the story, and then the next time we see that character, Bullet is nowhere to be seen, and she never comes up again. So yes, I understand all the jokes. But I got news for you guys. 
A lot of characters in these games don't play into the overall plot. Bullet at least provides some backstory and depth to the other characters, so hey, I'm cool with her. Plus, she's got a crazy unique try. She puts a ring around herself, and if you get inside of that ring when she's charging it, she will instantly run in and grapple you. Also worth pointing out that New 13 returned. Although, they lost Lambda, who again was just New 13. So again, not really a new character, more of just Blaze Blue's continuous game of robot musical chairs. Now those were the characters for the arcade release, but when it came to home consoles, they did add another character, Kagura Mutsuki, one of the strongest fighters on the planet and the head of the NOL's elite guards. He is also a drunk party animal who hits on everything that moves, so I guess you could say there's a lot of layers to him. Seriously, Sokka Bay, what's so great about this guy? I'm way more alpha than he is. Okay, maybe not a ton of layers, but there's something. His drive lets him take a stance, and while in this stance, all of his attacks do brand new moves, which can make doing his combos a little bit difficult, but he hits like a truck, so it's all good. Now, that was the only new console character, and in an interview with Silconera, Mori made sure to say that Chrono Phantasma would not have any DLC characters, so that was it. That was the roster you were going to get for this game. So anyway, the two DLC characters were Kokonoi. Yeah, remember her? Well, the sassy scientist finally jumps into the fray, summoning out weapons from portals, and her drive sets up gravity traps that allow for all kinds of crazy mix-up. Heck, there's even a trophy that you can get in the game that involves using her gravity devices to keep the opponent airborne for most of the match. By the way, quick note, I don't know who came up with the names for the trophies in this game, but I want them to know I see you and I appreciate you. These were great, A-plus trophy names all around, good job. And the second DLC character was Yuki Terumi. Now, who is Yuki Terumi? He's the big villain of the entire series. He's the one who forced Jin to cut Ragnar's arm off as a kid, and all this time he's been a spirit living inside of Hazuma, but now the two of them have separated and he's free and he's ready to just be the biggest a-hole imaginable. Seriously, his attacks are designed solely to make you feel bad. They are so dehumanizing and his drive steals your heat gauge and adds it to his own, giving him a ton of meter to burn through throughout the fight. And you know what, while we're talking about these brand new characters, I'm going to jump around a bit, because one year after this game hit consoles, the updated edition came out called Chrono Phantasma Extend. And for starters, the game brought Lambda back, meaning that now you had New and Lambda together for all your robot sword spamming needs, and also it introduced the brand new character, Celica A. Mercury. Celica has a mountain of lore behind her that we are going to save for the next video, but what you need to know about her is that she is a super sweet, kind hearted soul with healing magic that doesn't want anyone to fight and they want everyone to get along. Doesn't really sound like someone you'd expect to find in a fighting game, right? Well, don't worry, because Kokonoe built her a robot partner who does all the fighting for her, giving her some of the best animations in the game. I love her astral heat where she heals your entire life bar back, only for her robot to fly into the sky and then take you out when she's not looking. It is loaded with so much personality. So the combat's better, the cast is great, what isn't there to like about this game? Well, I'll admit, most people won't care about this, but there is one nitpick that I have with this installment. As I said, I really enjoyed Abysmo in the last game, and it does return for this game, but it's a little different now, and yeah, it's not as fun. The basic premise is the same, you're still making your way through a tower of battles, gain various buffs along the way, but now the buffs to your stats that you get remain whenever you start a brand new run. You don't have to purchase them all over again, which might sound like a good thing, but it means that they just keep stacking forever. So this isn't really a roguelike anymore where you have to figure out how to get the best run. You basically just keep playing through it, getting stronger and stronger until you can steamroll your opponents no problems. So it kind of takes some of the challenge out of it and makes it just feel like you're grinding in an RPG. But when talking about the single player modes, we have to bring up the story. And for Chrono Phantasma, the story mode received a massive overhaul. Gone were the days where every single character had their own unique story, instead there were only three stories. The main story, a story focusing on Sector 7, and a story focusing on the six legendary heroes. And to get to the end of the game, you had to complete each of them. But hey, we're going from 12 stories in the first game and 7 mandatory stories in the second game to only three. Great, that means this story mode will be easy to get through, I'll be able to clear through this thing in no time. 
Holy crap. Folks, I won't lie. I looked that number up before starting this game just to try and gauge how much time I would need to spend recording, and I thought, no way is that real. That's gotta be fake. That's gotta be like the story mode and the arcade modes and multiple different routes, right? Nope. That's the story mode all on its own. There are some bonus side stories that they add in and extend, and of course the gag stories return, which are always appreciated, but that main storyline is so long, I didn't have time for any of that. This thing is a beast. Yeah, this game hit arcades in November 2012, but they didn't come to home consoles until October of the next year. And it took another six months for it to be released outside of Japan, and I can pretty much guarantee you that was all thanks to the tidal wave of text that is this game's story mode. And folks, I'm not gonna criticize this story. No, I think the actual plot itself is just fine, but the density of this story is intimidating, and I'm not just speaking for myself. I talked about this a lot on social media, and I got so many replies from people saying, yeah, Chrono Phantasma is where I checked out. Heck, even I started wondering if I should even bother trying to summarize this story because I understood Calamity Trigger. I understood Continuum Shift. Chrono Phantasma left me with several questions. I had to ask around for the answers, and luckily a lot of people were willing to help me out, including some folks from the Blaze Blue Wikis, and they cleared up a lot for me, but... There's still some small nitty-gritty details that I got no clue on. And the extended version adds even more to the story, such as backgrounds on some of the big characters, some bonus gag reels, and a brand new mini light novel called Remix Heart Gaiden, which is based on the manga Blaze Blue Remix Heart. This focuses on Mai Natsumi, one of Noel's classmates who was actually born a boy but was then transformed into a girl through an Ars Magus, only for their father to then kick them out of the house because they hated this change, and now Mai lives in the NOL Academy dorms and is worried about their friends learning their secret. But over time, it was thanks to these friends that she was able to learn that she didn't need her father's approval, and she even came to not only accept, but even love the new life that she had. I've actually seen a lot of love and support from Mai from the trans community, because even though her situation is very unique and is full of sci-fi magical elements, a lot of people find things about her relationships and her journey that they relate to. So, this game took the story elements of the previous games and skyrocketed it to brand new levels that were quite simply maddening at times. But you want to know the really frustrating thing about this story mode? is that there is a secret additional mode that you can unlock, but only after finishing this monumental story, and this additional mode is actually really fun. You see, in the story, you end up facing off against this giant monster called Takimikazuchi, and after beating the game, you unlock Highlander Assault Mode, where you can then challenge Takimikazuchi with any character. And if you're looking for a challenge, this is it. In story mode, Takimikazuchi isn't all that bad, but in this mode? Ooh man, I lost count of how many times I died to this thing. He's got huge screen clearing attacks that deal massive damage while your attacks barely chip away at him, and eventually he just puts out there so many obstacles that are constantly firing at you, it practically turns this thing into a shmup shooter. But when you finally beat him, oh, it feels so good. Kinda shocked they didn't just put this in the game already unlocked in the extend version. I would love to tell people to play it, but... I don't know if I could tell them to sit through a dozen hour long story mode just to get here. Again, I have to stress, this story is alright, the plot is actually pretty intriguing, the characters are great, but you could have easily told this thing in half the time and far more coherently. But massive labyrinth of a story mode aside, I still love Chrono Phantasma. The combat reached close to perfection for me, so many of the new characters are incredibly fun, and you can still buy the extended version of this game, not just on Steam like all the other games, but on modern consoles as well. But after all of this, where can you go? Well, Mori described Chrono Phantasma as being roughly 80% of the way through the story, meaning we were quickly approaching that finale, so the very next game was going to be the one that brought this epic tale to an end. Blaze Blue Central Fiction launched in arcades in November 2015, and no, I don't know why every single arcade release of Blaze Blue came out in November. That's just a really weird coincidence. Or the entire secret to the lore is hidden in there somewhere. Either way, I'm not figuring it out. And yes, folks, you heard correct. This game was the finale to the Blaze Blue saga. Or at least the intended original saga. 
I don't know if you've noticed yet, but in addition to all these games coming out in November, they all share something else in common. Every single one of them has a subtitle that begins with the letter C. And that was intentional, as these four games were referred to as the C-Series and were meant to be one continuous storyline, with the original plan to continue Blaze Blue on with a brand new cast of characters and a new plotline later on. But, uh... Yeah, we'll get to that later. For now, let's see how this series went out. In terms of gameplay, guess what? There were several small changes and rebalances once again. Shocking, right? However, comparing the leap from the first game to the second game, and the second game to the third game, I feel like the changes between Chrono Phantasma and Central Fiction aren't nearly as big. Chrono Phantasma feels like a completely different game from Continuum Shift. Central Fiction feels like a really polished version of Chrono Phantasma. The only two big changes is that now, when you go into your overdrive mode, you can once again press all four buttons to activate Exceed Excel which is just a really fancy way of saying a free super. Yes, your regenerating Super Saiyan meter also gives you a free super on the house now. It's nuts, and I love it. And what makes this even better is the other brand new mechanic, Active Flow. This is a state that your character can enter when you've continuously been playing aggressive for a period of time, such as continuously attacking the opponent or constantly going in on them. And once activated, your damage increases, but more importantly, your overdrive meter recovers quicker. So, you pop overdrive, do some major damage, come out of overdrive, but then you keep attacking and you'll charge that drive back up in no time. Listen, I'll admit, I'm a super unga bunga fighter, I love going in and being aggressive in fighting games. Which is just my really nice way of saying I'm kinda stupid and I just like hitting buttons. So if you give me a mechanic that rewards being aggressive, I'm on board. As for the new content, this game introduced Speed Star mode, where you have to beat a set number of characters in a limited amount of time, but you could get bonus time by pulling off certain achievements. Again, really impressive how BlazBlue continued to come up with interesting single-player modes that are really addictive, all while using the resources already in the game itself. And speaking of that, Abyss mode returns! And god, it is weird this time! I put about 8 hours into Abyss mode in Central Fiction, and I didn't understand what I was doing until about halfway through that. Okay, let me see if I can explain this without chewing through my own tongue. There are now 8 different towers, each with 100 floors divided into easy, medium, and hard. But now, you have to equip a grimoire before going into combat. The grimoire will decide how much of a boost you can get to your stats, and you can equip skills to those grimoires. Am I saying grimoires too much? Too bad, because I'm not stopping! You unlock new skills after each normal fight, and a new grimoire after every 20th floor boss fight. As you fight, you will rank up your character, which lets you increase your stats. But, you also rank up your grimoire. Once your grimoire is maxed out, you can then destroy it and get all the skills in there back, but now those skills will level up into stronger versions of themselves. Problem is, grimoires can only hold skills up to a certain rank, and if you level a skill up too much, it might rank up, and then you might not have a grimoire that can handle it. So, okay. It's admittedly a little bit more complicated than the previous games. And I'm really torn on it, because on the one hand, it relies way too much on luck now. You don't get to pick your skills or your grimoires, they just give you one at random. So you might have to grind like crazy to get a grimoire that can actually handle the skills that you have. And to make matters worse, they put way too many roadblocks in your way. Because there's one more tower in here. The Boss Rush Tower. These are a series of fights against insanely strong opponents with flat out nutty abilities. I'm talking stuff like, only takes damage from counters. Their defense is so high that you can't damage them, but they lose defense each time you knock them down. Or my personal favorite, Unlimited Astral Heats. I bring this up because you start out only being able to challenge the easy towers. You want to move up to medium and get some stronger grimoires? You have to beat three of these bosses. Same goes for moving from medium to hard. So, you need strong grimoires to challenge these bosses. But you only have a small chance of getting the grimoires that you need in the tower that you're in. Meaning, you have to just keep grinding through them until you get lucky. So, yeah, the luck and grind factor is way too strong in this mode. But that being said, the boss rush mode with these busted abilities is a really fun idea. 
And once I finally did get a strong Ramar, I was able to level up my skills to insane levels. In the previous games, the regeneration ability was practically worthless. The rate at which it would heal your life back was practically nothing. But I got up to level 7 in this game, and now I was healing back faster than the computer could damage me. Building an unstoppable force and then trying to take on the computer's immovable object was good old broken fun. So yeah, even with these problems, I still got hooked on this mode and put way too much time into it. Again, fighting game developers, making single player content for your games is way easier than you might think. Just get weird with the resources that you already have and do something creative with it, and I'll play it for hours no matter how busted it is. But hey, a lot of people aren't going to go for the big crazy side modes. They want to stick to the basics, like arcade mode. And thank god Central Fiction decided to get weird with that too. Thanks to some reality warping muckety muck that I won't go into right now, almost every single character in this roster has not one, not two, but three arcade ladders with unique fights, boss battles, and endings for each of them. The most important thing when it comes to your single player content in a fighting game is figuring out a way to make your players want to keep using a character over and over. No one wants to just re-challenge the exact same arcade ladder or story mode over and over again with the exact same one character. So giving them not only a bunch of different modes that you can use those characters in that I already mentioned, but also three different arcade modes? Oh man, I can't lie. Even when I had all the footage that I needed for this video, I still found myself going, I like this character, I enjoy playing as them, and they still got two more arcade ladders. I mean, it can't hurt to go back in there again, right? Just to make sure I didn't miss something important? And what makes these triple arcade ladders even more impressive is the roster size. Including the DLC, there are a total of 36 characters. How big is 36 characters? Oh, we're not playing Grimm. I mean, that sounds like a thing. Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> I forget how many characters. Oh. Yeah, that is the power of reusing assets. You want to get a jaw dropping roster size with three arcade ladders for everyone? Use what you already have. As for the new characters, there's Hibiki Kohaku. He's the serious and professional assistant who keeps the slovenly Kagura in line. But he's also a very skilled assassin, and his drive ability lets him send out shadow duplicates across the field. It's worth noting that for Blaze Blue's 10th anniversary, Arxis held a character popularity poll, and despite only being playable in one game, Hibiki came in third. People love this guy. Probably because he's just an Attack on Titan character. You yeah, remember when Mori said they made these stories just by putting a bunch of stuff that he likes together? Yeah, it ain't even subtle on this one. Then there's Naoto Kuragane, who originally appeared in the manga spin-off Blaze Blue Blood Edge Experience. He has a boatload of lore behind him, but to try and keep this as simple as possible, he's basically an alternate reality version of Ragna. I promise you that's the simplest way I can explain it. He got sucked into this world looking for his friend Raquel, and now he's living through the Blaze Blue Isekai as he tries to find a way back home. He's mostly known for having crazy quick record attacks and dash cancels to extend his combos. I remember a few years ago for a charity stream I picked Naoto up for the very first time, and I'll never forget that someone in the chat said, quote, Say goodbye to your thumbs. Yeah, that's a pretty accurate warning for Naoto, alright. Then we move into the three big villains of the game, starting with Izanami, who is essentially the god of death. There is way more to her story though, but we'll save all that for part two and she definitely wears that grim, deathly nature on her big sleeves, with some of the creepiest supers and astral heats in the entire series. Then there's Nine the Phantom, one of the six legendary heroes who, after spending a hundred years in the Boundary, kinda went nuts and is ready to burn everything down. If you're a fan of this channel, you've definitely heard me bring up Nine before, because she has got one of my favorite fighting game gimmicks of any character ever. Each of her three basic buttons are linked to an elemental attack. Then, when you hit your drive button, you do a unique attack based on whatever the last three elements were that you used. She literally makes a witch's brew in the match with her attacks as ingredients. That's genius. And lastly, there's Suzunoo, the big final baddie of the entire series, and Yuki Terumi's true form. And Nine might have my favorite gimmick, but Suzunoo is a close second. You see all those locks down there at the bottom of the screen? Those are his special moves, and you can only use one of them when the match begins. However, whenever you attack the opponent, a highlight will appear over the different locks. 
Then when you hit the drive button, whatever attack is highlighted will be unlocked. That may sound really complicated and it might scare some people off from trying him, but all of his attacks flow and link together so smoothly that even if you never unlock any of his specials, you can still have a ton of fun with him and he can still do some massive damage. And while we're talking about Susan oh I have to bring this up. He has got one of the best themes in this entire series. It is a hard rock thrash metal song called Must Die. You know your character has reached ultimate edge status when their theme is called Must Die. In fact, you know what? I haven't brought it up yet because I was waiting for this exact moment right now. Blaze Blue has amazing music all around. I mentioned that Guilty Gear's creator Daisuke Ishiwatari did the score for this game, and if you know Daisuke Ishiwatari, you know his music goes all in. There are so many amazing themes in this game. Makoto's is this adventurous, upbeat score. The Sector 7 theme has this smooth, poppy, almost mechanical, getting stuff done vibe. Asriel has one of the best threatening villain themes ever, and Bang Shizugami has the ultimate put it on at the gym Saturday morning superhero theme. There are so many winners in this game's soundtrack, and again, the fact that this game kept reusing assets and kept bringing back characters, that meant they kept bringing back their score, so by the time you get to Central Fiction, you just have wall-to-wall -wall bangers all over the place. Now, back to Susanoo, I should mention that he was an unlockable character, but you could also buy him as DLC to get him instantly. And considering that the way to unlock him was to beat the story mode, the long... Long ass story mode. Yeah, nobody's going to judge you for just buying him. This isn't like Mortal Kombat 11, where if you play the story mode for an hour, then you unlock Frost, but they still decide to try and sell her to you anyways. No, there's legitimate reasons to just go ahead and fork over the cash now. And speaking of that, there were three other DLC characters. S, a robotic girl who comes from a spin-off game and has a mountain of lore behind her, but the only thing that you really need to know in this game is that she was summoned by the Azure itself to be its guardian. Then there's Mai Natsume. Yeah, remember her from the light novel last time? She finally gets to jump into the fray, and she fights with a giant spear that deals major damage and has huge range. And then the final character to be added, Jubei. Yes, a character who has been in this story ever since the very beginning was finally playable. Fans spent years asking for Jubei to be playable, and I'd like to think that's why he was saved until the end. I mean, if you gotta go out, might as well go out on the character everyone wants. Now once again, there is a gigantic story mode, and once again, they changed up the structure, but I actually dig it this time. Now, you only have one story, but after you complete a chapter, of which there are a hundred, by the way, just to give you an idea of this game's length, but whenever you complete a certain chapter, then you'll unlock a side story. These stories aren't long, some of them are only about five minutes, some of them are so short I could show you their entirety right now as I am saying this sentence. But these side stories show you what the other characters are doing during the moments in the main plot. It kind of reminds me of when a comic book company does a massive crossover event, and that's all contained within the main storyline, but then you got a tie-in issue over here that may or may not focus on something important and it just shows you what the other characters are up to. Now, as for the story itself, it's close to as long as Chrono Phantasma's, but it is far more comprehensive. I mean, granted, that's not really saying much, but I could at least understand most of it. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that this time, we finally got answers to some of the biggest questions in the entire series. Things that had been bugging me since the very first game were finally explored here, and that's great. But there is one small issue that I have with the story this time. And, well, honestly, the entire game itself, really. You see, Blaze Blue has been pretty lucky to not have any huge controversies. Each game sold pretty decently, there were no big behind the scenes disputes. At least over at Arxis, but this game was distributed by Axis, and yes, that did confuse me for several years. They were the ones responsible for the English dubs, and on August 24th, 2016, just a little over two months before the game would be released on home consoles, Axis took to Twitter and announced that because it would take about six months to do a dub, they were going to skip it this time and just put the game out with the Japanese track. And hey, that's understandable. I mean, I was upset to not get the English dub, but when these games are getting more competitive online scenes, so everybody needs to be able to start playing at the exact same time, and you run the risk of the conclusion of this storyline being spoiled over those six months, yeah, that's two good reasons to skip the dub so that way it can just be released around the world at the exact same time. 
What isn't understandable, though, is the fact that none of the English cast members were told about this. Yeah, the English cast, who had been with this game for close to a decade, found out they were not going to be coming back from this very tweet. Which, even if you don't care about the English dub, you have to admit that's maybe the most dickish way of telling someone their services are no longer needed. Patrick Seitz, the voice of Ragna, the script adapter and voice director for Continuum Shift Extend, and the guy who arranged for all the voice actors to be in the Blaze Blue anime, in other words, a guy who is kind of a big deal for these games, took to Facebook after this announcement and wrote, quote, I'm disappointed by the news and I'm especially disappointed to be getting it via tweet. Reaching out to the cast would have been a simple enough courtesy for access to extend. Maybe they think we don't much care either way, but many of us do. I know I do. TLDR version, Blaze Blue Central Fiction isn't getting dubbed. I'm sad about, I read about how impersonally I found out, and not putting any particular stock in a dub happening after the fact. After all this time, it hurts to be told that we're not so central to the fiction after all. Damn, a very personal appeal and some solid wordplay. And the cast weren't the only ones upset. A change.org petition was launched to prove to Arxis that they wanted the English dub to be added in. A petition that ended up gaining 6,656 signatures. God damn it, guys, you were 10 away from gaining a very appropriate number for this series. Well, as upset as people were about this decision, it didn't really translate to the reviews. This game received generally the same positive scores as the previous games. And while sales history for this game isn't available, based upon physical copies sold and going off of Steam Spy's digital record, it looks like the game ended up selling around 700 to 800,000 copies, which sure isn't as high as the first game, but it isn't uncommon for a game like this that just keeps changing and growing and building upon the previous game rather than trying to reset itself to slowly lose players over time. But hey, Seven to 800,000 was still pretty high for an Arc Systems game, and it remains incredibly popular in the FGC to this day. You go to any tournament anywhere, you're going to see a central fiction pool. And Arxis realized the popularity of this game because after Guilty Gear Strive saw a huge success largely thanks to their smooth rollback netcode, they announced out of nowhere that they were going to go back and patch rollback into the Steam version. Now, I don't exactly remember when the rollback got added to this game, but checking Steam charts, I don't think it was around here. Not here. I feel like it was somewhere around here. So if you want to get into this game and you don't want to mess with the endless ocean of single player content, you can still go online right now and play other people with some of the best netcode in the industry. So, that's it. That is the end of the main Blaze Blue story. But it is not all there is to the Blaze Blue franchise. Because Mori said he wanted to extend Blaze Blue beyond just the main series, and boy, he wasn't kidding about that. Because for a game with only four mainline installments, they pumped out so many spinoffs for this thing. Here we go, lightning round. First up, Blaze Blue Super Melee Fighters for the DS. It's an arena fighter using chibi characters that feel like they're meant to be a callback to the Teach Me Miss Lychee skits. Never played this one, but it does look super charming. What I did play though was the next game, Blaze Blue Clone Phantasma for the 3DS. It takes the chibi sprites of the last game and you just mash away at wave after wave of these cannon fodder clones. Again, this one looks charming, too bad the game itself stinks. It is completely mindless, way too repetitive, it feels like something that you would put out as a free phone game, and even then, there's way better free phone games out there. But if you do want to play it for any reason, it is still available on the 3DS eShop. At least for however long that sticks around. Next up, for phones and the Nintendo Switch, Eat Beat Dead Spike Son. This is a rhythm game where you control Dead Spike, the giant face that Ragna sends out as a projectile as it tries to eat up everything while dragging Ragna behind him. I did not know this game existed before doing this video, and I still can't believe it's real, but hey, it does look fun, and Blaze Blue music is great, so making a rhythm game around that does kind of make sense. Then you have Blaze Blue Battle Cards, a card game for phones released in 2015. Sadly, the game has been taken down and can no longer be played. But if you want a Blaze Blue card game, then I will go ahead and mention they did get a spin-off tie-in with the competitive deck building game, Exceed. But now we start getting into the big spin-offs. On the PS3 and Steam, a light novel called x Code Embryo was released. And you remember S? Yeah, this is where she's from. 
This is both a prequel to Blaze Blue and set in an alternate reality because nothing in Blaze Blue can ever just be one thing. It follows Toya Kagri, your typical light novel high school protagonist who one day discovers a mysterious conflict happening in his city where people are developing strange powers and they have to be hunted down by the robotic S. From there, S ends up moving in with Toya to make sure that he's not infected, and they end up meeting a ton of other characters that are all involved in this big battle between humans, sorcerers, and monsters, and S starts to open up and care about her new friends. It's not bad, but it is very by the books. I mean, you got a standard high school protag boy whose defining characteristic is he's nice and caring. He meets up with a blonde girl with a giant sword who moves in with him as she tries to protect him in this new strange war that he suddenly discovered. I mean, this is basically just a Fate Stay Night fanfic right here. Although I will say that a huge chunk of the terminology from Blaze Blue does show up in here, only slightly twisted for this new world that you find yourself in, so it was kind of neat going, oh, hey, they're talking about that thing. I understood that reference. Now, there is one interesting thing about this game, and that's how you progress through the story. There are multiple possible endings, but there's no decisions that you have to make throughout the game. Instead, you'll occasionally get news stories on your phone, and you have to check them. Depending on what stories you decide to read will determine what path the game takes. It's an interesting idea, although I was reading up how you get these different endings online, and it said that to get character-specific endings, you must only read stories that are also being read by those characters. But you don't know who's read what stories until after you've opened up and read those stories yourself. So... How are you supposed to know what stories to read? How are you supposed to do this on your first try without a guide? You don't know if you were right or wrong until after you've already read the article. Also, have to point this out, I didn't realize that's what you were supposed to do until I got halfway through the game. And if you haven't read enough articles by that point, then the villain shows up, kills you, and the game just ends. It doesn't even cut to credits, it just takes you right back to the title screen. So I went online, read what I did wrong, went back to an old autosave, and just started reading everything that I could, got back to the halfway point, and the villain once again still showed up and killed me. I went to an even older autosave, read every single report that I could, even got trophies for all the reports I was reading, and the villain still showed up and killed me and kicked me right back to the tile screen. So I looked into it, and apparently several other people have had this problem, so I can't tell if it's a bug, or if it's one of those things where once you get the bad ending, you're just locked into the bad ending, and the only way to get something new is start the game fresh from the very beginning. So, yeah, I won't lie to you guys, I didn't finish this one. I looked up the rest of the game on YouTube, but considering it's a light novel, I feel I got the gist of it. And while I do think that this ends up being too generic, I still found it to be mildly entertaining. Unlike its sequel, x Plays Lost Memories, which might be one of the worst things I've ever played for these retrospectives. And I want you longtime fans out there to think about all the games I've had to play for these retrospectives in the past, and then realize what I just said. I complained about this game on Twitter, and someone told me, uh, clearly you don't know what a light novel is. Oh, I know what a light novel is. I'm very familiar with light novels. Which is why I feel confident in saying, this is a bad light novel. Folks, if you're defending this thing just because it's a light novel, that's the equivalent of me saying Shaq Fu is a great video game because it's a fighting game, and that's the only criteria I have. x plays Code Embryo might have been kind of generic, but it at least wasn't ear-gratingly annoying, and it was at least a new story. x plays Lost Memory, on the other hand... Okay, at the end of Code Embryo, S realized that she was a threat to reality, so she left for some pocket dimension between the Boundary and her world. But then, all of her friends ended up getting hurt because she wasn't there to protect them, so the pain of that caused her to lose all of her memories. Cut to some time later, and a brand new protagonist, just called Me, goes looking for her younger sister who ran away. She stumbles into S's pocket dimension, and now she finds S, or at least the embryo power that was within S, but now she's an airheaded ditz wearing nothing but lingerie. You then have to walk around these blank generic maps, picking up four memory fragments, and after each fragment, you're treated to something that makes me want to eat my own game console, so that way I don't have to listen to it anymore. <laughs> Hey, 
しょ早く妹のところに行きたいのそうだった妹ちゃんが待ってるんだよし行こう行こう言われなくても行くわよ Yeah, it's that over and over every time that you find a fragment. Then, when you have all four memory fragments, S, now calling herself nobody, will quiz you on what she talked to you about, and if you get the questions right, then you can move on to the next floor. If you get them wrong, then you just take the quiz again. There is literally no negative to screwing these up other than just wasting your own time. You then move on to the next floor, but in between these floors, you watch scenes from the first game play out. And these scenes go on as long, if not longer, than the rest of the game. Once I realized, oh, this is just the game that I already played through, I'm gaining nothing from watching this, I just started mashing my way through these cutscenes. And I swear to you, it still took me almost 15 minutes to get through one of these cutscenes. And again, that was with me just mashing the skip button non stop. This, this is kind of disgusting. Like, if you want to say, oh, I don't care if the gameplay is bad, I don't play light novels for the gameplay, then fine. I still think it sucks, but whatever, it's not the point. The story is, I understand that. But speaking of the story, just think about this. Think about the fact that over half of this game is just watching the game that you more than likely already played. And that's it. The vast majority of what you're doing is just walking around a bland map, grabbing an item, watching a child scream at a lingerie model, and then watching footage of the thing that you already played. It's just that over and over. Well, okay, I'll admit, I'm exaggerating a little bit here. All the scenes from the first game are now being told from S's point of view, so you do get a new perspective on the whole situation. And that also does mean that you do see a few scenes that did not get shown in the original game. And there are some additional scenes between characters that you can unlock that are brand new. And at the end of the game, you do get a brand new bit of story that shows how S does end up coming back. So if you are just the biggest S stan out there, then sure, I can see how you would enjoy this game. I, however, am not the biggest S stan, so to me, this game was nothing more than just watching everything that I had just already watched and a never ending conversation between an airhead and a screaming toddler. Oh, and you want to know the kicker? You want to know what really kills me about this game? It's that out of all the Blaze Blue spin offs, this is the one that actually has canon lore to it. Not only does this game explain how S comes back and therefore is able to be in central fiction, But also, the nameless protag, the screaming toddler in question. Yeah, that's Nine. That's right. That's Nine the Phantom. And her lost sister that she's looking for is Celica. This is actually a secret origin story for Nine. And I love Nine. I love Celica. But no bit of backstory is worth saying through any of these exchanges. Well, luckily, our next spinoff game wasn't just a massive improvement, it was also another fighting game. Although, when this new title was revealed at EVO 2017, it was not what people were expecting. Central Fiction had been out for a year, and the final DLC had just been revealed, so when people saw a big trailer startup with Jin and Ragna squaring off, they thought, oh, is this an update to Central Fiction? No, wait, that's a, that's a brand new stage. Could, could this be a brand new game? Could, could we already be getting the next Blaze Blue? Only to be greeted with this. Listen to that crowd. That is the sound of a stadium full of people collectively losing their minds. Hell, look at that kid. He's having a religious experience right now. I remember the first time that I saw this trailer. I'm not kidding you. I legit thought it was a joke. Like, I fully expected Mori to just come up there on stage and just go, ah, I gotcha. But no, this was 100% real. Toshimichi Mori said that for his next game, he wanted to do a tag fighter. And originally, he intended for the game to just use Blaze Blue characters. But because of how wild and varied the playstyles of Blaze Blue characters were, he said that it would be too difficult to put them on teams together. Think about that for a second. This series began with Mori saying they wanted to tone down the combat to make it more accessible. 
And now four games in, these characters were so insane that if you had to control more than one of them at a time, your face would melt. So he decided to make a completely new game with brand new combat, and it was going to be a crossover between Blaze Blue and... Well, really just any franchise he could get his hands on. The game launched with characters from Persona 4 Arena, Under Night and Birth, and the anime series Ruby all thrown into a pot to make one big anime gumbo. Now, Persona 4 and Under Night and Birth makes sense. I mean, Under Night and Birth was already a fighting game, and Arxis helped to develop that. Persona 4 got a fighting game spin-off that Arxis made, so yeah, obviously those two could show up. But why Ruby? How the heck did this internet anime series that never had a fighting game before get thrown into this mix? Well, honestly, it's actually kind of simple. Toshi Michimori just said in an interview with Forbes magazine that he liked Ruby, then Rooster Teeth heard about this, reached out to him, and yeah, that's it. It's kind of wild how often big video game crossovers happen, not because of giant massive corporations coming together and working something out, but just because two guys happen to say hi to each other. Now, I'll be honest with you. I do have some complaints about this game. Hell, many people do. Blaze Blue was a series that, as I said, had tons of single-player content. But this game only had the story modes, and that's it. But the big complaint that people were up in arms about was that this game was announced to have 40 characters. Wow, that's huge! And half of them were going to be DLC. Yeah, I've seen some crummy DLC practices before, but revealing that half of your roster would be DLC before the game even came out isn't a good look. Also, this is a tag-based fighter and a crossover, and those two tend to have really large rosters, so that way you can fit in there a good chunk of characters from all the various franchises. So launching with only 20 characters was way too low. I mean, heck, Ruby only has four main characters, and two of them were going to be DLC. You couldn't even put all four of them in the base roster? And once again, this game was reusing assets as it took all the sprites from the other games and put them in here, with the Ruby sprites being the only exceptions. And as I said, I love reusing assets because it allows you to include more characters. So why are there only 20? Central Fiction had just come out two years before this, and it launched with over 30 characters. If you wanted to get someone into these games, why would you suggest the game with a significantly smaller roster when the much larger game with far more content in it is right over there and still gains support? However, despite these problems, I still love this game. And it is all because of the gameplay. Yes, the inputs are simpler than they were in Central Fiction, but it still is one of the most insane fighters in recent history. You can pull off incredible combos with just a few buttons, the amount of defensive and offensive mechanics are through the roof, and the combat moves so fast. Heck, this became one of the first fighting games that I ever platinum because I just wanted to keep playing it. I kept wanting to match different characters together and see what weird combinations I could come up with. Not just for mechanical reasons, but also because this game made sure to lay on the fan service as so many different characters have unique interactions with each other. And most of the FGCs seem to enjoy this as well. The game built up a strong player base and even became the first Blaze Blue game to be featured two years in a row at EVO. And beyond the combat, listen, I like Blaze Blue, I like Persona, I like Undernight. It's just fun seeing these characters together, especially in the story mode, which didn't just bring back the English cast for all the returning characters, it even provided English voices for the characters who didn't get them in Central Fiction as well as for the entire cast of Undernight in Birth, which to this day has never had an English dub. And the story mode is immensely simpler this time around, and it pretty much only exists just for fun. It's just here to be a good time seeing these characters together. And I'm cool with that. I mean, I'm a massive Persona nerd, so seeing Chie hanging out with Ragna and talk about the power of friendship while Ragna just looks at her like, the hell are you talking about? I love it. Plus, I just have to throw this out there. Out of all the wacky, nutty Arxis round announcers, Can't Escape from Crossing Fate is easily my favorite, and I'm legit mad this game is no longer talked about, because for six months I kept laughing my butt off at all the memes people were making around it. You win. He does look like the father on Fresh Prince. <laughs> Can't Escape from Crossing Fate! Fight! But here's where the wackiness got cranked up to 11. Yes, the game had a disgusting amount of DLC, but after the initial storm passed, they announced a second season in Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle 2.0. This didn't just see updates to the gameplay and brand new story content, but also several brand new fighters. 
including multiple characters from brand new series. You now had characters joining the fray from Arcana Hearts, Sinran Kagura, because of course Mori P is a Sinran Kagura fan, and even the super niche cult favorite fighter Akatsuki Blitzkamp, including the Blitz Tank, who I honestly believe might have gotten more people talking about this game than any other update for any game Arxis has ever made. Even people who didn't know what Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle was were saying, They got a tank. I'm sorry. Did somebody just say a tank? Real talk, at the end of the day, despite all the problems that I have with this game, I still love the combat, and the final roster update made me want more. If you ask me, hey, what one fighting game would you want to see another season of DLC for? I would say Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle without even thinking about it. I wanted to see what Season 3 was going to bring us because it feels like this was just one more update away from being the officially licensed version of Mugen. We could have gotten all the weird obscure fighters together. Breaker's Revenge, Asura Blade, Rumblefish, Matra Melee, Melty Blood, you know Melty Blood would have been in there. Anything not nailed down could have been up for grabs in that Season 3 of DLC and I wish it had happened. I don't know. Even if it's no longer gained updates, just like Central Fiction, its final update did install rollback netcode into the game, so that way you and all your friends can cross fate without any hiccups online. And that brings us to the final spinoff and the most recent Blaze Blue title. In August 2017, Mori announced that a brand new RPG would be on the way for phones and mobile devices called Blaze Blue Alternative Dark Wars. And I don't know much about the development of this game, not a lot has been revealed just yet, but I can tell you. It was not good, because the game was announced in 2017 with an expected 2018 release date, and it would not come out until February 2021. Okay, a three year long delay on a game that was expected to be developed in just one year. Not a great start, but was the game fun at least? I honestly have no idea. This game never got a global release, so all information that I have on is pretty much just secondhand accounts. But from what I've gathered talking to people online, you pick a blank protagonist to represent yourself while being escorted around by the brand new character Seal Sulphur, and you then work for the Mitsurugi Agency, an organization that first appeared in the X-Blaze games, and after the events of Central Fiction, multiple realities, or possibilities as this franchise calls them, are created and now you have to pair up with Blaze Blue characters from the main series, the spin-offs, the mangas, the past, the future, and just flat out alternate versions of themselves to stop these brand new threats. These alternate versions can include things like Young Valkenhayn, Tsubaki from the future wearing Hakuman style armor, which was actually teased at the end of Central Fiction, and evil versions of Mai and Kagura. This game looks nuts, and it apparently had some big massive overarching plot to it that was going to mean a lot to the entire lore of Blaze Blue, and we're never going to find out what that was. Because yes, after being trapped in development hell for four years, this game was released in February 2021, and then shut down in January 2022, not even making it a full year. Mori took to social media and commented on the announcement saying, quote, From the beginning, various difficulties have arisen in continuing its operation. We have been trying various approaches to making our users enjoy the service as much as possible, but the results have not been what we hoped for. As our customers may well know, we have been running the game for almost a year with various problems, and both development and operation have been going through trial and error every day. So yeah, we don't know the specifics, but it's clear that the production of this game was a mess and they just couldn't keep it going. And you know that hit Mori hard, he had huge plans for this game. He even went on Twitter and tweeted out that the true villain of the series was going to be revealed to be... This guy! Who is this guy? It's the generic Protag man from X-Blaze. Yes, the good boy everyman Protag was going to be revealed to have a dark gritty future self. Do you think Mori P likes the Fate series? I think Mori P likes the Fate series. So yes, sadly Dark Wars was a bust, but Mori did come out in spring of this year and announced that there was more Blaze Blue on the way and in July it was announced that a brand new roguelike set within the series was going to be coming to mobile devices and for PC. Alright, hey, I mean, it's not a fighting game, but roguelikes are fun. 
the gameplay preview looks pretty good, and Mori made it sound like there was going to be even more Blaze Blue planned after this. The future of this series has yet to be written, and there is still a universe of possibilities still open for this beloved series. Blaze Blue creator Toshimichi Mori leaves Arc System Works. Of course he did! I forgot it's still 2022, the year where every game I do a retrospective on has to have a bad ending. Yes, in September of this year, some eagle-eyed fans noticed that Toshimichi Mori's name had been removed from Arc System's list of directors. And then, a few days later, Mori took to Twitter and confirmed everyone's fears that he had indeed left the company. And that's about all we know. Yeah, there has been no other information revealed about this so far. But considering that Mori has been light on details, and nobody else from Arc Systems has commented on the situation, and Mori doesn't have any future jobs lined up at the moment, this doesn't exactly sound like things ended on the best note. Normally when someone leaves for greater things or to pursue their own goals, typically everyone at the company wishes them well, they don't tend to bury it and go radio silent. So we have no idea why Mori stepped down, maybe he did want to pursue a different path, but considering how much he loved this universe and these characters and now he won't be able to use them anymore, I kinda doubt it, and I hate to just start speculating, but it could very well have had something to do with the fact that Alternative Dark Wars spent four years in production hell, only to then be shut down before its one year anniversary. Yeah, you spend that much time on a live service only for it to crash that hard? That's not the kind of thing that you can just wash off your record. I mean, heck, this wasn't even the first BlazBlue mobile game that failed, they already had a strike against them with that card game but it could also have had something to do with the changing face of Arc Systems. After the last Blaze Blue, Arc Systems kind of exploded. They were hired by Bandai Namco to develop the insanely popular Dragon Ball Fighters, leading to success unlike anything the company had ever seen. And that translated into sales for their other games as well. I mentioned that Guilty Gear, despite being their flagship title, never really sold all that well. That is, until Guilty Gear Strive came out and sold a million copies in a year, which I know some people might think, that's not that impressive, but for Guilty Gear, yeah, that's really darn impressive. It was the biggest Guilty Gear release of all time, and was bigger than the last several Blaze Blues. As a result of these increasing sales, Arx's CEO Kiraoka announced that they wanted the company to actively pursue more fighting games based on existing IPs that are popular in the West. And Blaze Blue definitely has Western fans, but not as many as some other IPs that they could be pursuing. Mori. Arxis is now a Western developer. Maybe Western audiences enjoy Blaze Blue. We don't know. And frankly, we don't want to know. It's an IP that we can do without. Again, these are 100% just speculations based upon the evidence that we have available to us, which is certainly not the complete picture. But yeah, decreasing sales, years of work and money put into a failed project, Mori wanting to focus on pretty much anything that wasn't a fighting game while the company just wanted to focus on fighting games. There's a good chance there was a lot of factors behind this. Now, Mori has said that he isn't done making games, and he wants his next game to be one that the Blaze Blue fans will enjoy, but that next game would not be Blaze Blue. Arxis still owns that title and the characters, meaning Mori can't touch it. So, in a very wild, roundabout, cosmic levels of irony way, this story has now come full circle. Because Arxis made Blaze Blue because they no longer own their flagship title that they created. And now, Arxis is the one holding on to the flagship title whose original creator no longer owns it. Now again, I have to stress this. This just happened three months ago. We have no idea if Arxis has any plans for the future of Blaze Blue. I kind of doubt it, but as I said, there is that roguelike already in the works. Which has not been mentioned at all since this story broke, but still, it could still be out there. Point is, maybe we still do have more Blaze Blue on the way. Or maybe they'll just sell the title back to Mori and then he gets to make Blaze Blue again. I mean, he and Daisuke are still friends as far as I know, and Daisuke knows a thing or two about what it's like to lose a series that you put your heart and soul into, so maybe they'd be willing to work something out. But there's no way of sugarcoating this. The future of this series looks very murky. At least when it comes to new releases. Because here's the thing, folks. You can still get every single one of these games on Steam right now. 
And as I said, Central Fiction and Cross Tag Battle got rollback updates and still get featured at not just major tournaments, but also pretty much any local scene that you can find. The Blaze Blue fanbase is still incredibly active. You can still find people easily who want to play. And even if the fanbase dries up one day, even if everyone just decides overnight, I'm tired of this now, guess what? Because these games are loaded with a metric ton of single player features, you can still enjoy these games by yourself for days and weeks and months without running out of content. The point I'm trying to make is that Blaze Blue is something special. It is that perfect combination of memorable characters and fast addictive gameplay. It's got the fan base that still holds it up and the credentials in the FGC to continue being a strong force on the competitive scene for years. And thankfully, because this game was made back before every single fine game out there had to be 100% esports live service focused, it means every single game is its own complete package that can survive without the company supporting it. I've been looking forward to tackling this game ever since the start of the year, and going back and doing this deep dive has given me an appreciation for almost every angle of this series. From the music, to the characters, to even the lore, and especially the gameplay. Folks, I record more footage for this retrospective than for any other single video I've ever done. Normally, I just spend about a week capturing footage for these videos, and for this one, I took two and a half weeks of non-stop recording day and night, and yet I still had to force myself to stop playing them because I just wanted to keep going. So yeah, no matter what happens in the future, if there's a new game from Arxis, a new franchise from Mori in this game's memory, or even if there's nothing, this series is kind of future-proof. It's easily available with timeless combat and appeal, meaning as long as you're ready to jump into the series and pick up a controller, then the wheels of fate will never stop turning. Folks, thank you very much for tuning in to another epic length retrospective here on this channel. Again, if you like what you saw here today, then make sure that you click that subscribe button. I mentioned it at the beginning of the video, but we're trying to hit 50,000 subs by the end of the year. And oh man, we're close. We are so, so close. We just need that last little push. So if you guys could help us out, we would appreciate that so much. And if you're already subscribed and you still want to help this channel, then make sure that you give us a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. That stuff lets YouTube know that they should be spraying this around. And you can also spread it around yourself and share it around the web wherever you think people might enjoy it. That stuff really does help this channel out. And if you want to get in touch with me, then you can find me out there in the boundary of the internet, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Tumblr, all at Thorgy's Arcade. Thank you guys very much for tuning in today. I hope you all had a very safe, happy holiday season. Thank you very much for all the support that you've given us this year. And I will see you all in 2023.